And good morning. It is a Friday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. I am Glenn Clark. He is Stan the Fan Charles. Back in studio with us on a Friday edition of the program. Thank you. Good morning. Everything good? Everything very good. Great. Getting closer to going to Sarasota. Oh, when are you headed out? I'm heading out in 10 days, the 5th. And you can March. already taste the hot dog. Oh, can't wait. The, this is what you live for. This is this time of year. I, I did an entire segment last night on the radio show about how February is the worst month. Right. N- no disrespect. February stinks. It's awful. I, Rita did the, remind the month me. of love. Yeah. She reminded me it's also it's Black. Valentine's Day. Yeah, it stinks. Now, she reminded me it's Black History Month, and I do want to make sure that I'm separating yeah, that right. it has nothing to do with Black History Month. Right. I, now I see God, why you hate it. God yeah. bless the idea of Black History Month, but so it's not it has like, to do with Valentine's Day. It, but it's all, there's, the, okay, I yesterday had that moment. I don't know if you do this now in your life, but I had the moment where I said, it's Thursday, the weekend's coming. Great right. news. Right. And then I said, but what in the F am I looking for? Right. But it's still Doesn't not, not you're not going to sit not outside right. today no, and do no, anything. No. It's just, it's February. The Super Bowl is fine, but it's the worst of the football games. Like, it's the pomp and circumstance right. nonsense. It's the worst football game of the year for just enjoying football. You're not playing fantasy football any longer. There's no, like, it's just one standalone game. Nobody can get it. The NBA All-Star game obviously stinks. You pretend for a second like you might care about the Daytona 500, then you remember, I don't give a rat's ass about this. I'm not watching this. I'm not getting, it doesn't get me through the week thinking, boy, the Daytona 500's coming up. The only thing that can get you through February is if your favorite college basketball team is particularly good In the hunt. and yeah. playing big games, then you can really get amped up for there's a big game this weekend. Obviously, we don't have that feeling here right now. My, my favorite team is... Yeah, they're they're Allison. they're they're trying. They won last night, which is good, and they covered. Was that, that was important. Yeah, no, he's a, he's talking about Towson. Oh, damn. yes, Towson. They're in the hunt, but they're they're doing some dumb things along the way in uh, order to try yeah. to stay. In the, the game hunt. I'm so the game I'm aggravated about the last couple of days. Not to take away from your February. I want to make it very clear. February is the worst month of the year. Okay. February number one with the bullet. Worst month of the year, and I would I would defy anyone to argue otherwise. I can't disagree with yeah. that, except that each day that goes by, you're closer to March. I, I hear that. Yeah. March is a good month. Yeah. I would put March uh, somewhere in the middle, I think. It's a good month to I, me. I, I would like say the March. fall months and the spring months are the best months of the year. I don't think there's any You start about with that. the weather, right? Yeah. Like, everything starts with weather, so yeah. those knock out, like, the first five or so. I think March could come in right around six. Yeah. Go ahead. The game that I watched the other night, and I'm very aggravated that I didn't bet on it because uh, it, it just, it's just I found out at like two minutes before game time that it was on, was the uh, um, uh, Connecticut at oh, Creighton, Creighton game. Yeah, yeah. I bet a few dollars on Creighton to make the final four. I, you told I watched, me that. Watch, they yeah. kill. They pretty much kill everybody. Yep. So and, uh, they were down nine three, and I go, well, I guess I'm. Glad I didn't bet this game. And then after that, they outscored them by about 25 points. I believe the game was on Tuesday or Tuesday night, right? Yes. So yeah, on Tuesday morning, right. and I brought it up on the show, I, I look at ESPN.com, and I look at their college basketball. We have Patrick Stevens on every Tuesday. And I always want to make sure there's nothing, big national college basketball story that I'm not paying attention to. Right. And so I go to it, and the first like post is, who would you rather have, UConn or the field? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'll take like, the field. Yes, obviously you're taking the field. Yeah. I get that UConn in the weeks leading up had probably been very, the best team. Yeah, they won like 12 but, in a row, I think. But yeah. pretending like UConn had separated themselves from the rest of college basketball right, is they're utter, somehow invincible. Like, wait, where in the world was that coming from? And it reminds me, this is the worst month of the year. And they're so forced to come up with topics because there isn't a genuine topic to have that they say stupid things like UConn or the field. Like anybody on those panels even watches any of the rest of the teams in college basketball until March. Right. It's nonsense. This month stinks, and I can't wait for it to be over. we got to do an extra day of What's it this year. What's date? The 23rd. 23rd. Next so time you close. and I are together, we won't have to worry about the doldrums of February anymore. And in fact, in a little bit of a way, the doldrums start to end this weekend because spring training baseball. Uh, comes into our lives a little bit. So Stan is here. Coming up a little bit later on in the program, Jeremy Fowler, ESPN NFL Insider. Remember, last week, Jeremy Fowler 
reported that in talking to his sources around the NFL, he believes the Ravens will be looking at a running back of, or quote, of pedigree, unquote, which I think led to all of the many Derrick Henry rumors this week surrounding the Baltimore Ravens. It's bizarre to me, but we'll talk to Jeremy Fowler about it a little bit later on. Also this morning, Paul Biancardi, ESPN National College Basketball Recruiting Analyst, former college basketball head coach. I know he's at Wright State. I don't remember where else Paul Biancardi coached. Um, but he is their go-to recruiting guy on top of being a college basketball analyst for them. And so he was actually the one that broke the uh, Derek Queen news that uh, he was going to commit to the University of Maryland. So we'll find out more from Paul Biancardi about exactly what it is that Maryland is getting in Baltimore native Derek Queen. Speaking of college basketball, I've been watching a fair amount of it lately. Uh, do, have you ever had Fran Forshello on the show? I have. I like yeah. Fran. You, you like him as a guest? I The problem for me with Fran anymore is that like he became like the go-to international analyst, like if you ever watch I mean, their international players, when they, when if you watch, do you watch their NBA draft coverage? Ever? Not particularly. Like he's there to tell you everything, everything there you is know to about. know about the international players, right? And so it doesn't really, unfortunately, it doesn't really touch us a right. whole heck of a lot. Right. So I don't really have a lot of reason typically to put Fran Fraschilla yeah. on the show, but I've had him on. I, I, do you, are you not I a thought, fan? No. Oh, okay. I thought he's. I th- think he does a terrific job. He also apparently is trying to spread his wings. They, the announcer was sucking up to him about what a great uh, analyst he is on MMA action. Really? Okay. You know? Yeah, because they were... They were <laughs> well, now tout- Griffin's worried because he, he were, wants that spot. <laughs> they were touting a game... They were touting a game last Saturday. I think it was... It may have been the Iowa State-Houston game. I'm okay. not sure who... But he was on the game. He does a lot of the Big 12, I think. Yes, he does do a lot of Big 12. Um, and... They had something coming up that night on ESPN, I think. Okay. Like and a, he was touting. A UFC card of some was, sort. Yeah. Right. He was touting something, some fighter. I, who knew? That I think he did win. I tell you who's done. It's a real shame that Maryland doesn't matter this year because I tell you who I actually think is very good is uh, Josh Pastner, the former Georgia Tech and uh-huh. Memphis coach. He's been doing uh, Peacock. He's- this season and has been like doing their halftime he's stuff. He's only like about 38, 39 years I don't think old. anymore he's still 38, 39. He's, I'm pretty sure he's, he's into 48. his yeah, he's into his 40s now. But, yes, he started in his coaching career at a very young yeah. age. Yeah. Um, and he's been excellent, but there's just yeah. not really been any reason to yeah. talk about Maryland basketball, unfortunately. So it is kind of what it is when it comes to that. Stan, today's show is brought to you by Superbook. And, of course, on top of betting all of the games this weekend, Superbook's got a lot of baseball futures bets available to you. And inside this new print issue of PressBox, which is available right now, your neighborhood Royal Farms, any of the hundreds of locations around town where you find PressBox, you'll find uh, some suggestions from myself, Stan the Fan Charles, and others about some baseball futures bets that you could make through Superbook right now. Giving him a little free plug. Oh, the Green Turtle. We love the Green Turtle. And yeah, Jeremy Conn. Jeremy, Jeremy Conn's Con. face, yeah. Did you see uh, Jeremy's got a new TV uh, commercial I did see for the, the Green Turtle. Very good. <laughs> looking good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he told me that it took like 13 hours. <laughs> he told me it was the longest day of his life Hell, yeah. to make a 30-second commercial. Mm. And you know who he blames for it? Gary Stein. <laughs> Gary Stein was the one responsible for making the commercial. He's like, and it took forever. I said, that's Steiner for you. Look good, um, though. He does. Perfection. Does, he does, Perfection he does, personified. He does look good. Some of the uh, futures bets that are available. Right now, you could bet which major league team will finish with the least wins this season. Uh, well, Problem Colo- is. Colorado Rockies. Oh, that's off the beaten path. Everybody's betting the athletics, obviously. A- athletics yeah, are even. I mean, the athletics have picked up. Alex Wood, mm-hmm. Ross Stripling. You oh think any gosh. of them? Yeah, you think any of them will be on the team in July, Stan? Have... <laughs> Those two, still, yes. <laughs> I still think they'll win more games than the Rockies. Wow, Stan says bet at plus two twenty-five the Rockies to finish with the fewest wins in baseball this season. The White Sox are plus fifty as the third choice, and then the Nationals plus one thousand as the fourth choice. I do that one just because it'd be funny. Do you hate the Nationals? Uh, no, I don't hate the Nationals, but See, it's, I'm, I'm very it's, indifferent towards yeah, but the it's Nationals. It's funny if they're not good. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. 
So you can get that bet in right now. You can also bet whether any team specifically throughout baseball will make the playoffs. The Orioles are minus 210 to make the playoffs this season. Get to Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use the code GlennClark23 or StanCharles23 when you sign up, and you'll receive up to $250 on a same-day first bet match, win or lose. So, Stan, with games starting tomorrow. Mm Mm-hmm. My question, and I want to go maybe three deep for you. I know we won't be able to watch all of them. We will be able to watch tomorrow's. I appreciate the fact that they – I don't know if the reason why Corbin Burns is starting tomorrow is because the game is on TV, but if there was any thought given to that, I think that's a really, really good idea that someone might have said, hey, I know we don't care who starts the first one, but this one's on TV. Maybe let it be Corbin Burns to try to get a bit of excitement back in Baltimore for the new ace in town. Who's starting, Cole Irvin? No, it's Corbin Burns. Oh, it Corbin Burns. Burns. That's what I said. I, I don't oh, know if okay. anybody within the organization bent Brandon Hyde's ear and said, hey, I – David Rubenstein. I, I, Stein. I, I don't want him to meddle, but I don't even think that would be a bad – I I just I, – look, I have no – this is not a conspiracy. This is not me saying that, Brand, that Brandon Hyde was planning on starting somebody else. Mm-hmm. I'm saying if someone else in the organization happened to say, Brandon, don't know what your plans are, but there's only so many of these games on TV. It'd be really nice if the first one that's on a Saturday that people could be watching, that we put Corbin Burns out there to try to generate a little bit more excitement back home for baseball starting. What, I actually uh, think what that time be, is that game starting? It's a 1 o'clock game. 1 o'clock, okay. 1 o'clock game. Three things yeah. for you that during the course of the games themselves, the things that we can watch, so not the will they add another pitcher, not the Kyle Bradish's elbow right. exam. Three on-field things between now and opening day that are most interesting for you, that you'll be paying the most attention to, whether it's watching at home or when you get down to Florida yourself. Um, number one's got to be Jackson Holiday. With a bullet. Yeah. Uh, no question. See if he really belongs where we're hoping he belongs. Because I'll be honest, when I analyze the Orioles and I take into account the quote unquote regression to the mean, mm-hmm. you know, they were incredibly fortunate. Would they win 24 one run games? Uh, last if you year? expand it out, I did the math this week to expand out, include extra inning games right. and two run games. Right. 49 and 24 in close close games, games. right Th- that that's unusual it and certainly is and one of the key members of that of that was Felix Bautista no doubt uh, having when you when you look when you bookend the last injury they had last year and the first injury they had this year even factoring in the addition of Corbin Burns that's that's a huge loss to me Bradish and Bautista um, and Kimbrell and Burns, they can make up for those specific losses, but where the dominoes fall, to me, it's important that Jackson Holiday be more, much more than pedestrian if he's to make this team. Yep. Uh, I think he, he would change the dynamic of the offense tremendously. And I keep, like, the the thing that I've been feeling more of this week, Stan, is that it's almost outrageous how much we're expecting of Jackson. Jackson Holiday's played 18 games at AAA. Right. He's not legally allowed to drink. And yet our expectations are he's going to be a superstar this right season. Right out of the get-go. At right. the major league level, almost from, you know, opening day. Right. That's crazy really now i get it there are people and the orioles aren't backing off of it and that was a point that a couple people made to me this week like yeah it is kind of crazy but the orioles aren't pushing back at it at all even off the record like nobody within the organization is saying hey let's nobody's pumping the brakes yeah let's pump the brakes a little bit let's remember how young this kid is let's remember and like and that's gonna that's gonna be what's interesting to watch this spring is to see if he really belongs at this point or does he need 60, 80 games at AAA to polish off his development to get get him to the big leagues. I, I don't know the answer to that right now. Eric, we had Eric Garfield yep. on again. He says he, he looks absolutely sensational uh, defensively and he's put on a good bit of muscle, you know, and strength. His uh, exit velocities right now are pretty off the charts. So we'll see. 
Yeah, we'll see. So That's I'm gonna, number one. I'm going to end up having Griffin post these on the website because yeah. we are both in agreement that Jackson Holiday specifically is yeah. by far and away number one. Can I add in a like a one A to the holiday conversation? Yeah. What in total the infield is going to look like? It, is it as simple as they've committed to Jackson Holiday being the second baseman? That's what he's going to be come hell or high water, or are there still moving parts involved? In I that? don't think. I don't think they've. They've settled on the fact that Jackson Holiday is going to make the team. They're saying all all the things that would lead you to that belief. But what if he hits 130 in 60 at bats down there, and he just doesn't look like he's well, ready? I, I agreed on that. I'm I'm just saying where he plays to me is like oh he's going to play second base unless Gunnar Henderson is uh, is hurt. That's and it's fascinating to me that it's just the commitment. I like it yeah. if that's truly the case because as I said before. When you're making the adjustment to the major league level, I don't like the thing where guys are also trying to play one position one night, another position. Give them one thing to focus on. Mm -hmm. Say, get comfortable. You're doing this when you play. Now adjust to the major league level and then worry about whether or not they can play other positions down the road. When, yeah, when they're I, adjusting, just let them play a position. I, I think that position, depending on Henderson's health, and the, the hope that his injury is just, uh, like they're saying, a small three-week thing, and then he'll be fine. I think Henderson's the second baseman. I think Westberg starts the season at third base, mm -hmm. but they're they're couching themselves by the fact that Ramon Nurias is still in the ball, ball club as of right now. So, I don't expect him to be okay. on opening day. By the way, that's one of my three you're, yeah. you're now getting into with the conversation. Okay. So can I give you my – I'll make it my two then just because you like that. My two is, unlike some years, there are more major league players on this team right now than there are spots to be had. This is not a – someone who's not really a major league player will end up getting a – will end up right. earning a roster spot type right. of situation. Or like five, four years ago when they had like about yeah, six well, yeah, was, of those None guys. of them were major league right. players, right. This year, I take Umbrance. Uh, umbrance <laughs> at that. It's a Rio yeah. Ruiz, right, know, it's a quality major league, major league player. Yeah. They have more major league players yeah. in camp, legitimate guys that are in that are major leaguers today than they have roster spots to be had, and not only roster spots, they have more major league outfielders than they have at bats to give yeah. major league outfielders right now. All right. So, what's your number two? My number two is who's going to get the spots? Like, right. is this a just straight up competition? Who has the best spring? If if Colton Kowser looks brilliant in the spring, he's going to have to be on the team no matter what. Like that to me, there is a question about who's winning roster spots because they're come hell or high water, you assume Jorge Mateo is going to be on the team. They just love the speed. They love the fact that he can hit lefties. They they just like him. Now they want him to be a super utility guy on mm -hmm. top of it. You assume that Jorge Mateo is going to be on the team. I no. would expect to see him in the outfield a good bit during the spring training game. Obviously, McCann's going to – you're going to have a spot for a second catcher. Obviously, McCann is going to be on the team. So that's two spots. Beyond the top nine guys, right, I'm including O'Hearn in that conversation. Right. Beyond the top nine guys, you already have two spots that are locked up to me. That's no matter. eleven. That's eleven. Right. You and bring you got up two more spots. You right? bring up Arias. You bring up Kowser. Kowser. I, and I put Kowser slash Kerstad. One of the two of you them. You say one of them is going to be on the team. Yeah. Then you would be opening up a spot if Ramon Arias is not making the team. Correct. For, for for maybe one of the two of them, so that they it potentially they, the possibility way that both Kowser and Kerstad get on the yeah. team yeah. is if Ramona Rios yeah. is no longer on the team. Right. But they have been inclined to like Ramona Rios, and as, I'm a, I just think if it, unless Henderson's hurt, he becomes very expendable to me, and that's why I still thought that we were lined up. For a trade when we had Joey Ortiz, mm -hmm. I thought the Marlins were kind of silly to not really push to get Urias and Ortiz and one of either Kowser or Kerstad for Jesus Lazardo and maybe a relief pitcher. You know, I thought they were foolish. I thought they could have taken care of two thirds of their the left side of their infield for the next few years inexpensively. So I Marlins. I would say what I'm watching for is. Is, is it fait accompli? Is it a situation where this is our roster, provided no one gets hurt, it doesn't really matter? Or is it a genuine, 
one of these other guys, these these major league invites, these you know cash consideration acquisitions that we all kind of laugh at and dismiss, is there a spot to be had in their mind? Are they saying no? We actually think Nick Matone might be a player. Like right. he's not just here to to be here. He's here because we yeah, want to look at him. Even he's on the uh, and and know. and the Burdick guys like that. Like are they internally saying if these guys have good springs? Which guy did they already? They already got rid they of. They did get rid of one of those. Burdick was it Burdick that they got rid Burdock? of? Peyton Burdick was the one yeah, that got rid of. He's already gone. God, and Diego and I, Castillo, and I was, and I was just getting, and I was just, just getting, getting to know him. Like, yeah, I was just, you're very upset. About I am that. really sad. That's about why the February Peyton, is a bad worst month. month. Worst they month. got rid of Peyton Burdick. God. Sam Hilliard is still on the club, as right. far as the, I understand. This group of guys, Ryan McKenna is still Ryan on the McKenna, team. and they had a tendency to love Ryan. McKenna I mean, he may end years. up somehow making a spot. So I would say that of McKenna, Hilliard, Urias. And the two really big prospects, Kowser and Kerstad, two of them will make the team. And so to me, what I'm watching for is, is it about production? Is right. is it – we talk about this all the time with the the football preseason, where guy, people want to believe that if they watch a preseason game and someone looks great in the preseason game, that that's going to mean that guy is going to be on the team. And what I say more often than not is that they've got a roster set. They, they go into this saying, this is our roster – and it's very rare that someone can win their way onto the roster, even in training camp, even in – it almost takes injuries. It yeah. takes – But more, you get a lot more injuries in football. M- and yeah. No doubt about that. And yeah. more often than not, what can happen is, say, what happened with Malik Hall a year ago, where, like, we're not going to put you on the roster, but we're also not going to let you get away. Right. Like, we like you, and you pop during training camp – and that means we're going to come up with an injury that allows you to be around. Mm-hmm. We don't really have room on the roster for you. We've decided what our roster is going to be. Right. But you did enough that we're going to do something sneaky here. You can't. It doesn't work the same way, obviously, no. in baseball. No, it doesn't. They, they're not going to be able to do that. So that, to me, is number two. Is, is, is any of that group, if they go off during spring, does that give them a shot at the roster, or is the roster essentially set going in? That would be my number two. I, I think there's a a real battle between what their needs are, injuries, and, you know, who who they would like to make the team. And I would think that Kowser, Kowser and Kerstad is the most interesting battle if you think that they'll end up keeping and, one of and them. And I think what you're alluding to also is the at-bat situation. That even if you say, well, those are two, obviously those are the two best, best players, players of the right. group, but internally they might be saying to themselves, but how are we going – you already have three starters in the outfield. Right. You're the, the one of these guys is going to be your fourth outfielder to begin with. You can you're going to keep Colton Kowser as your fifth outfielder. When is he playing? Yeah. If that's the case, yeah. so I think that a lot of people are of the belief that you're keeping only one of them on the team because the other one just has to be at AAA in order to play and continue to get it back. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Listen, is that we all we all are also hoping that Ryan O'Hearn is this year what he was 100%. last year. That's a very unproven thing. I've That's told fair. this story a hundred mm-hmm. times about 1986 when Earl Weaver was back for his first full season managing the team. Remember, he managed the last yep. two and a half months of 85. You weren't even born yet. No, I, I was born, think. yes, okay. but I wasn't. You were. I, 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 don't, dad, I don't have dad, memories dad, of it. Dad, yeah, dad, I mean, dad. Let's not pretend. It was when I was knocking, uh, criticizing Eddie Murray and Weaver came up to me one day. He said, I listen to your show. He goes, you really think I give a shit about what Eddie Murray's doing right now in May? He, and he, I, I, he goes, him and Ripken, they've done it before. Those are the two guys. And he right. pointed at Mike Young, the late Mike Young now, and Floyd Rayford, who had had tremendous second halves of 85. Mm-hmm. And we said, boy, they're really going to be great players. He said, those are the two guys I'm worried about. Yep. You should be worried about, yep. too. He goes, they've never done it before. And both of them, their careers were basically over within about yep. a year and a half of that. No, I think it's very fair. Like, Ryan O'Hearn was I, a revelation. He was fantastic. A year ago. Yeah. But to the point that, does that guarantee that that's who Ryan O'Hearn is right. versus he just had a really good year? And I think we can ask this question about a, a lot of people. This is not unique to Ryan O'Hearn or unique to – I think you can ask this in some ways about – 
we're all very dejected about Kyle Bradish. Did we know for sure that Kyle Bradish was proving that he's going to be a top of the rotation pitcher, or did he have the season of his life a year ago, right? Like, I think you can ask these questions about a lot of people, and I think it's a totally fair thing to bring up with Ryan O'Hearn that we're penciling him for a roster spot, whereas they might say, yeah, that's really Heston Kerstad. Like, the thing that Ryan O'Hearn, you think he's going to do for us, we think Heston Kerstad is actually I doing for us. Can I tell you my brother's idea what Ryan O'Hearn should do? My brother is an advertising yes. executive, great, very successful, very creative. He thinks Ryan O'Hearn should have changed his name legally to Ryan O's. How do you get O's rid of him? Hearn. You can't. You can't yeah. get rid of him at that point. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. Like, you just have no choice. He's right. got to be on the team forever, like in perpetuity is the way that it works. So is is number two more specifically for you, Kowser versus Kowser versus Kerstad? Kerstad would be number two for me. I like that. I yeah. like that. All right, what about number three? Uh, that that's the that's the trickiest one for me because I got Can I can I give you one? Yeah, sure. You can throw out. I haven't Do any of the young pitchers force their way into the conversation that's a very for good, a rota- like That's a very good even not even rotation. Does a Seth Johnson yeah, or Yeah, end up cracking the bullpen. Or Chase that, McDermott. I I'm I agree that that's plausible for me, but yeah. I would almost say is anybody so good that and I, with, I mean this with all due respect to Cole Irvin, who, by the way, is going to I believe is going to join us on Monday's show. Right. I, is are any of them? Do they flash so wanna, much? He didn't want to talk. To oh, me. there was a whole. It was a whole she thing. In fact, I it. offered to rearrange the show, to, and right. he was like, "Stan." In fact, he suggested maybe you don't come to Florida. <laughs> I don't really? want to. I don't want to say like vengeance was a word a, that I'll was thrown out there. I I told you this is really uh, that I, we weren't going to tell confidence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll give you one name that that would be very interesting is Wanderson Charles. So I, he's a distant D- Daniel cousin Al- of mine. Yeah, <laughs> he got everybody's a cousin of yours. It's real weird how that works yeah. out. Uh, Daniel Allen Tuck at the Baltimore Banner wrote about Wanderson Charles recently. Mm-hmm. Is like, could this be this year's Yenier Cano? Um, right. I, fascinating and i'll be interested to see it i'll I'll separate i'll my thought is could one of them be so good that you end up reconsider if let's say cole Irvin doesn't look great in spring right and one of these guys is brilliant in spring right is there any conversation where you say why do we have to give the fifth spot to cole Irvin? right why can't we see if we have something in Chase McDermott, Chase McDermott would right? be the guy to me. I think Povich, they're going to want to to do a little more polish at AAA. Um, you know, I think all three of them, McDermott, Johnson, Seth Johnson, and uh, Povich, might become options in June or July. Sure. You know. Sure. I think but that's... then again, the Orioles are most likely going to have this, this excess of talent, you know, that they're just going to – you just can't keep everybody, you know. Uh, yes, that's part yeah. of it, and it'll be interesting to see how they go about handling that. I, I'll give you my third, okay. okay? My third would be to watch how close Kobe Mayo is to really pushing the club to to make a larger decision. You know, I understand it looks like he's going to play all third base right now. That's what Eric Garfield is seeing down there right now. It says he looks – Really terrific, you know, in in shape. In so, shape. so the question would be, who's he pushing away, right? I don't right. think he's got any chance to make the club in yes. spring training. Uh, I think he has a chance to really say, boy, he m- may only be two months away. You know, and two months of a baseball season can go by like that. And and again, this and come, then we'll be two months closer to February again. Let me let me pose this to you. So, we talked about. Um, the the rumor of uh, the Jesus Lazardo Samuel Basayo ask from right. the Marlins, if they asked for Mayo instead, would you be would you consider it, or is he moving into the untouchable category for you as well? He's pretty darn close to untouchable, but Lazardo, you know, first of all, I'm expecting that Bradish will end up needing the Tommy mm-hmm. John surgery. What I'm hearing down there. Eric told us, like, during practice, pitching drills, mm-hmm. he's underhanding the ball to first base. He's not even throwing, like, throwing the By ball. the way, if you missed it, Stan and Eric got together yesterday, facebook.com slash pressboxsports, youtube.com slash pressboxonline, or pressboxonline.com slash video. And he is at Eric 
underscore Birdland, mm-hmm. uh, and he's got video of everything going on down there, you know, in training camp. So I I say that, like, the interesting part about this conversation to me is, are the Orioles going to start overvaluing left-handed bats versus right-handed bats? And that's part of the conversation. The people that say Samuel Basayo should be untouchable, part of it is it's a left-handed bat, and now in Baltimore, left-handed bats have to be viewed as more valuable. Now, you can't just have left-handed bats. Like, you, you, you can't do that. You still have to have a lineup that is balanced. You can't just stack left-handed bats and go through it that way. But if the ask was Mayo instead and said, okay, if you're, if you're overvaluing the lefty bat of Basayo, if the ask was Mayo instead, I, I'm in a strange place where, to me, almost at this point, those guys can't be untouchable. I've used the word... And I, somebody can come up with a better word. I don't remember who didn't like it when I said incongruent. I, there's something a little bit odd about doing the Burns thing and having not followed it up yet, right? Like it's a you're you're essentially going in on a guy that's right now likely to be here for one year, and saying there's a bit of a one year window here, but only a bit of a one year window here. It's odd to me. There's been no follow up to acquiring Curb and Burns. If it was Lizardo, you'd say, okay, I get it, right? Like, 100%, I get it. I, I wonder if at this point you can call anyone untouchable or if you have to declare the window is open now. Not all in, not reckless, not throwing away guys for the sake of throwing them away, but just saying no one can be untouchable when you've entered into a period of time where you believe that you can win World Series. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that the, the Orioles are in that 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 place right now where they can win a World Series. Um, you know, despite everything that went on last year, the the loss of Bautista mm-hmm. and now Bradish is, is it's significant. Huge. I agree. It's huge. It's huge. I would say that Jackson Holiday is untouchable. I would say that Mayo is right there, a uh, step behind Holiday, and Basayo to me is just because of his age is a step back uh, those three players I think are all virtually untouchable I think the Orioles feel we've got enough ammo to make a trade without giving up one of them it's tough right like it, I, I guess it comes down to what you're making a trade for yeah. in order to pull that off like I don't think to get a a cost controlled player for a few years it feels like it's going to be difficult to get any of those guys without touching from that top tier of talent in order to pull that off and to say it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a caught, it doesn't, right? Like you don't, it doesn't have to be that guy. You could just sign someone that's yep. still an option that's on the table that they have yet to choose to do at this point. So, um, but yeah, I hear you. And um, I, I will be fascinated to see how close Kobe Mayo looks. I do, I, I guess I would warn. There's always the people that, like, when someone has a great spring and then isn't on the roster, there's the fear of, well, you're not keeping the best players. And I, I think I'm over that. Like, I, I think we know now the rules no longer behoove a team to forcefully leave someone at the minor league level to start the season. And if you're doing it, it's because you genuinely believe that player isn't quite ready to be at the major league level Either anymore. not quite ready or will not be well served by being here as as you said the fifth the f- Kerstat or Kowser should not right. be sitting 4 days a week 5 days a week up here just because they're the best player you you want to continue their development and then if an injury strikes and it's been 3 or 4 weeks since Kerstat's played regularly do you know that he's going to be able to jump in Whereas if he's back playing at Triple A, you know darn well that he'll be he'll be sharp. Yep, one hundred percent. All right, we'll get those up at uh, GlennClarkRadio dot com a little bit later on. Uh, one other Orioles thought, Stan. Uh, there was a story this week in the Baltimore Banner about Austin Hayes being interested in trying to do an extension with the Orioles. I, I'm in a very strange place with this conversation because. I think most of us are in the like Austin Hayes, but probably not a centerpiece of this thing phase of the conversation. At the same time, I don't know how much luck the Orioles are having in engaging in extension conversations 
with the guys we'd want them to have extension conversations with. Is there a world in which Austin Hayes could stick around, could see this thing through just as, hey, you need solid baseball players too. You need a core of solid baseball players, and he's a solid baseball player that it wouldn't be a bad thing to have him around if he's interested in sticking around. I think this is a key year, not only in terms of how Austin Hayes plays, but how Kowser and Kerstad advance this year. You know, we could find out that we've been wrong on one of them or both of them, you know, and Hayes may have a terrific year, and all of a sudden you're you're weighing which one would you keep. Um, I would think that the Orioles under Mike Elias would prefer to always be moving to have the cheaper player, mm-hmm. if the, if all things are equal, to have less dollars on the book and use Hayes in a trade. But, again, if Kerstad and Kowser struggle this year, not that I expect them to struggle to the extent that Kyle Stowers has struggled, mm-hmm. um, you might say, you know what? Four years of Austin Hayes at, you know, $65 million right. is not a bad deal. That, uh, you know? that Nick Markakis level money. Yeah. I'm mean, not saying that Austin Hayes, I even think, is Nick Markakis, but right. just considering inflation, inflation it's about that, right. that's about the number that you're right. looking at in order to try right. to do something. Nick was, uh, he signed with Atlanta for about 11 a year, and that was about 10 years ago, I think, 10 or 11 I years was thinking ago. of the deal that he did with the Orioles. That was, was that six years, 66? He got four years, $44 million. From the Orioles. No, from the I'm uh, thinking bridge. of the deal that he did with the Orioles when he signed. I remember signed. that deal. I remember that was the deal. Remember, he was facing uh, oh, yeah. cervical fusion. Yeah, surgery. that was the reason. Uh, now i got to remember what the uh, Marcakis contract, <clears> the uh, <throat> Orioles contract. I want to say it was a, it was about the same per year. It was about $11 million per year, if I remember correctly, but... I'll look that up in a second. Okay. Today's show brought to you by, ooh, it's brought to you by Live Casino and Hotel. Griffin, what's going on at Live Casino and Hotel? Uh, Live Casino and Hotel Maryland at Sports and Social is the place to be this weekend and by the every way, I weekend. Six years, 66 was the deal that he did with the Orioles. That was in, uh, what year would that have been? Oh, nine. Yeah, oh, nine. So. And uh, and uh, we mentioned it yesterday, the PFL versus Bellator card. You'll be able to check that. It'd be 12 hours of M- MMA, essentially, tomorrow. Yay. Uh, as you got PFL Bellator leading right into UFC Mexico City. So uh, Sports and Social will be the place to check that out because uh, they have an on-site fan location, and it is your ultimate spot to watch those sports and your favorite games on the massive 100-foot media wall. Order up your favorite game day bites. Take a sip from the signature crushes and extensive beer selections all just steps away from the FanDuel Sportsbook. So watch, wager, and win at Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. Adirondo Mills must be 21. Please play responsibly for help. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLING. I'll say this, even if you're not a big fight fan, like you get to the Sports and Social and you hang out in that atmosphere, you'll be a fan of just about anything that's up on that screen because it is a Electric. We come back in, have not had a chance to chat this week with Stan about uh, the great lefty Drizel, so we're going to do that next. It's Glenn Clark Radio. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GlennClark23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best. And use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. There's so much focus on sports betting these days, but I want to talk about an area that nobody wants to gamble on. Where you choose to go out and spend your hard-earned dollars to eat. The Casas Inn is no gamble at all. The quality on their menu is outstanding, and the value is off the charts with a great and varied list of specials Monday through Friday. And the staples of the menu, whether it's salads, burgers, fish, they're all fantastic. Fantastic. And I haven't even mentioned the crabs or crab cakes yet. So check out the menu for yourself at CostasIn.com. When choosing a place to dine, never gamble on the food you put in your belly. The Costas Inn at 4100 North Point Boulevard or call 410-477-1975 for reservations and your steam crab orders. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels. Heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, AJMichaels.com. 
Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. Discover your next favorite beer crafted in the heart of Charm City. At Guilford Hall Brewery, we believe beer should be flavorful and easy to enjoy. Our meticulously crafted lagers and ales are derived from centuries-old European brewing traditions, a staple for both the seasoned beer aficionado or a novice hophead. Experience beer styles that dare to showcase the exceptionality of simplicity. Visit our restaurant and brewery at 1611 Guilford Avenue or view our menu and tap map online at guilfordhall.com. Guilford Hall Brewery, European tradition, Baltimore charm. The latest edition of Press Box is available now, and on the cover we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolka on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinator Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. All right, back in here on GCR. Sam the Fan Charles is in studio with us on a Friday edition of the program. And uh, you could read this week at PressBoxOnline.com Stan's reflections on the passing of the legendary lefty Drizel. And I was surprised by how emotional you were um, in sort of pouring out there at the end about uh, the passing of lefty Drizel. I, I know, I mean, because we've actually, uh, the two of us together have chatted with lefty Drizel, and I know how much you enjoyed yeah. those conversations, but it, it did sort of catch me a little bit how emotional yeah. you were talking about lefty. I, I, to the best of my recollection, I never actually met lefty. Really? Had him on, had him on uh, different shows and talked to him. Uh, you know, I periodically, I periodically would just call him when something was up in the world of sports in basketball and just sort of chat with him and he always was uh very friendly to me and uh we had some good conversations but sometimes people are larger than life to you and uh he was one of those people to me you know I was like 18 years old when I went to University of Maryland and uh wow he he was what, just taking over I was gonna say what years was, were the, was this Stan? I went to College Park for one year I went 1969-70 oh wow yeah, yeah right at the infancy yeah. And I had been a ball boy for the, for the ironically the Baltimore Bullets. Mm-hmm. Baltimore That's a Bullets. Pretty great hat, by the way. Um, and uh, had met Fred Hetzel because Rick Barry was my favorite player, mm-hmm. and Hetzel and Rick Barry were on the same team. And I liked uh, Fred Hetzel as a player. And then Lefty got it wasn't Tom McMillan, but his first player that he really, I think he inherited him more, but was Will Hetzel, okay, Fred's brother. And I remember at the College Park Deli uh, walking up to him and telling him that, you know, I, I knew your brother a little bit. You know, I was a ball boy. And he was like, get the hell out of my way. You know? <laughs> you know. But it was uh, but Lefty uh, meant a lot to me because, you know, up to that point in time, Maryland basketball really virtually meant nothing Stan, to any of us. That's the part of the conversation. It's everybody that I've talked to, and we, you know, we put on John Lucas, and we put on yeah. Tom McMillan, and I, I keep coming back to I, I think because of Lefty's personality and his, to your point, larger than life nature. And when you think of Lefty, you think of the drawl, and you think of him saying Leonard, and you think of him genuflecting. Well, you know, I know, you know, I ain't stupid. All of you, know. you think of all of those things, and you think of the character that Lefty was, and UCLA of the East, and Midnight Matt. You think of all of those things. I genuinely believe that what gets lost is how miraculous of a job he did as a basketball coach. How yeah. truly insane it was. That when he showed up, he made these insane proclamations. And by the way, within five years, Maryland was right in the mix among national powers. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, he was a uh, very similar, to like maybe ba- college basketball's first PT Barnum, 
I mean, he he really. I would say there's a Jim Harbaugh parallel in there that like the way that people think of Jim Harbaugh now is someone who showed up and was just doing yeah. crazy things yeah, and a getting good, a ton of attention. That's a good comp. And, that's a good comp. and it, it yeah. almost overshadowed that he was also a a good coach, right? Like Lefty Drizel was was doing some wild things, yeah. but it was overshadowing that he was a hell of a coach. Yeah. And I think what gets lost in the shuffle, Glenn is when people go, well, but he never won an NCAA double championship, yep. and he only appeared in a couple, you know, Sweet 16s. Yeah, maybe the Elite Eight, but never a Final rem- Four. Remember that when he started coaching at Maryland, I, I think I'm right, there were 16 teams yep. that made it. Yep. And then they went to 32. So it wasn't until, like, maybe his last two or three years at Maryland that it was the the – 64. Yep, you had so, you had to win the ACC in order to reach Basically had to the win NCAA. the ACC or you were up shit's creek. And and it's been talked like that him winning it's it's so difficult for a young person even somebody my age it's difficult to understand the significance of the NIT that they won. Like yeah. it's very you say someone won the NIT you're like yeah, right. Okay. A chuckle under your okay. breath. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Why did they even go there? And I, I, it's funny because I remember the first year that Maryland missed the tournament under Gary after that long streak where they had made the tournament every year. I remember him pulling me aside one day, like almost hellbent on teaching me about the history of the NIT and how significant the NIT was. Like, Did you know Al McGuire wouldn't go to the NCAA tournament because the NIT was that much more important? And I'm like, okay, Gary. Like, mm-hmm. you know, because in my mind, I'm like, you're just trying to make it seem like you accomplish. You're- and and the truth is, like, that all mattered. That was all relevant. Now, it didn't matter in whatever year that would have been, 2006 or whatever year it was that Gary made. It didn't matter then. Like, But it did matter it is relevant. Like when Maryland won the NIT, it was a very big deal to have won that tournament at that point. Yeah, it was a legitimately viewed championship. It's not an NCAA championship, but it was damn close. I wrote in my in my column that he, when he declared that he was going to try make, he didn't say I'm going to try. He said I'm going to make uh, Maryland the UCLA of the East. He 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 got to within a couple players and a couple plays of really accomplishing that, you know, but because he happened to be, have his best teams at the time David Thompson yep. was around, yep. uh, made it incredibly hard to uh, get past that team. And again, like you said, you didn't get past one of the teams in your conference, and that was a deep conference. Uh, you were you weren't getting into the it, tournament. I, it, it was, I was reminded, I don't I think it might have been Len this week who reminded me, like, we were the number three team in the country. Yeah. And we didn't go to the NCAA tournament. It it's insane. And you go yeah. back to it's it's ironic that we were talking, you know, last week with Gary and you brought up because we were talking about the twentieth anniversary of the two thousand four ACC championship. They also celebrated the fortieth anniversary of the eighty four ACC championship when finally Lefty was able to break through and win that tournament. But you referenced how brutally difficult it was for anyone outside of North Carolina to win that tournament. And that was the thing. If you didn't do that, you couldn't go to the NCAA tournament. It was brutally difficult for Maryland and for Lefty Drizel and what he was up against. And by the way, you know, Dean Smith was at North Carolina and, you know, Mike Krzyzewski was in his infancy at Duke and starting to lay the foundation for what would ultimately become Norm that. Sloan and was at NC Terry State. Terry Holland at Terry Virginia Holland with Virginia, Ralph Sampson. Ralph Sampson, he had. Right. And, you know, the, the best player he probably ever signed – Signed never with played. commitment <laughs> right. was Moses Malone, Correct. and he alluded to that at his uh, induction into uh, Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield uh, when he was 86 years old. So it was six years ago, he said, and I, he goes, and by the way, Moses Malone had passed away about a year before the Lefty's induction, yeah. and he said, "I love Moses Malone, you know, and had he ever really played at Maryland, I probably wouldn't have had to wait this long." Yep. I, by the way, I had not watched. I'm glad that you referenced it in your piece because it made me go back and and watch it. It was myself. great, wasn't it? Yeah, it was tremendous. And I I love when it, I love yeah, the, the, the opening, Shashevsky the Shashevsky yeah, right. thing. People ask me why Mike, and I don't know that the two of them were particularly that friendly. 
but he was one of the three presenters, uh, along with John Thompson, who Lefty was not very friendly no, with. No, no. Uh, and George Rattling, who was his assistant coach, who he gave cre- equal credit. Yep. And he said... He goes, in fact, Midnight Madness, George Ravling, may have, he may have been the one that thought of it. <laughs> right. He goes, I'm not that smart. <laughs> but when he said about left about Mike Krzyzewski, he said, people ask me why Mike wins so many games. Well, he, he, went, to, he went to Army, West Point. He goes, and they teach you there, if, you're, if you don't listen to your leader, you, you get to- killed. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's funny you, you bring that up because um, – I, I don't know how close they were, the two. I know that Mike Krzyzewski did a lot to try to get Lefty into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I know. Well, that I think he was, appreciated him a great deal. There was a huge push from Mike Krzyzewski to yeah. get Lefty into the Hall of Fame. And in talking to these guys this week, I get the sense that they might have been closer than you. Like, I mean, all, it's of, po- all, of, all of them referenced that, like, we thought Lefty hated Dean Smith. Like, right. we internally believe that they genuinely hated each other as it turns out they were spending their off seasons together we didn't know about that until dean was in poor health and lefty was right there beside him and we found out that lefty and dean had been close the entire time like he was so good as a showman and as a you know a a figure that even his own players genuinely believed that he hated dean smith personally and that it was all you know, very right. passionate when it was really just basketball. Yeah, that's all it that it was. It was just business. Yeah. Um, and you bring up George Raveling, of course, and that's the other conversation that we've been having a lot this week is that y- you give credit to Lefty Drizel for the role that he played. in. Integ- you have to. Like, he played a significant role in integration in the ACC and in the South in college basketball. But it's almost like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because as all these guys admit, Lefty wasn't trying to prove something. He wasn't trying to make a statement. He was just trying to get the best basketball. He just wanted to win basketball games. And in the process of trying to win basketball games, he said, I I don't care. You know, it's almost the post-racial thought. Like, the I'm... We, we 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 knock the idea of I don't see color, right? Because the idea is, well, you're supposed to see color to understand bias and to understand all those things. But that was truly lefty, like, being the I don't... I don't care. I just want basketball players. I... It, it, it wasn't that he was hell-bent on, I'm going to integrate come hell or high water. It was, I think Charlie Scott's a damn good basketball player, and I want to have him on my team because he's a damn good basketball player. And in the process of that, he just so happened to end up largely you know, playing a massive role in integrating the ACC, George yeah. Raveling being the first ever uh, black coach that was hired in the ACC. And he had, had Mike Malloy, obviously, at Davidson. And nearly landed Charlie Scott as well. And a lot of people would say that if he had gotten Charlie Scott to Davidson, he may have never been the Maryland coach because he would have maybe won a national championship at Davidson and just stuck around there at that point if that had been the case. So it's an po- important part of his story and his history. And when we talk about Lefty Drizel, we have to talk about it. But it was almost, like I don't want to say by accident, it was just him trying to win basketball games and be a hell of a basketball coach. Yeah. Um, I, I love the man. I loved every, I cherished every conversation that I had with him, and I didn't get to experience Lefty Drizel, the basketball coach, obviously. I was far too young. Um, at, for him, the Lefty Drizel at Maryland, the basketball coach. I, I think Lefty was a, was a good basketball coach, probably a little better than we give him credit for. He was not a great X's and O's coach. What what he really should recruiter, be remembered obviously. is that he was a program builder. Mm-hmm. I mean he he always left a, a place in better shape than when he came. You know, I always used to say about Bill Parcells, who is a great football coach, but every place he left was not better when he left. Mm, interesting. You know? interesting. Uh, lefty to me, what he did at Davidson yep. was historic. What he did in Maryland was historic. And then, then he went and won James NCAA Madison. tournaments. And got the NCAA tournaments yeah. at Madison and Georgia State. Yeah, like insane. Only coach to win a hundred games at four different, at least a hundred games. Didn't we find out somebody ended up joining him in that list? Yes, Cliff Ellis. Cliff uh, Ellis. Cliff Ellis. Up, but at the time, Parker he was Kessel. the first. Yes. Yeah, he was yeah. the only one to have done it. Um, no, remarkable, remarkable basketball life of Lefty Drizel. And I did, Stan. I appreciated you. You're showing a little vulnerability in the way that you talked about Lefty in your column this yeah, week. I thought well, that was – This one hit me a little bit. It it didn't hit me quite as hard because it didn't come out of nowhere. Sure. When they had that event 
three, four weeks yeah, prior and all his players were there and he couldn't be there, you sort of said something's up, you know. So, And I just happened to be experiencing that. My wife has several fr- really good friends of hers uh, that are that are passing right now. I'm so sorry. It's a tough, I am, tough time. I'm yeah. sorry to uh, to you and to James yep. for that, and Jane yep. for that. Appreciate though uh, what you shared, and if you guys haven't read it, I would encourage you to get the pressboxonline.com and just go to Stan the Fans page, and um, you'll find that there. Stan's reflections on the life of Lefty Drizell, and in fact, Stan, I would tell you it was so good it made me decide not to write about Lefty this week i just said i'm gonna leave that alone and let uh, stan's voice be our voice about lefty because i thought it was it was everything that needed to be said about the man well, thank you thank you all right we are going to talk about uh, the possibility of the ravens adding a running back which i'm still confused by i gotta be honest with you i still don't know what to make of it today's show is brought to you by your local toyota dealers and we appreciate toyota because they make county sports zone possible CountySportsZone.com is your headquarters for local high school scores, schedules, and standings across all sports. CountySportsZone.com is proudly sponsored by Toyota. We'll talk a little bit about the Ravens' running back picture, and then we'll bring in uh, Jeremy Fowler from ESPN to discuss what they might be doing about it. That's next. Stands here. It's Glenn Clark Radio. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. Two dollars of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GLENNCLARK23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best and use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Six chicken tenders made from fresh, never-frozen Royal Farms world-famous chicken, a family-sized order of Western fries, honey mustard dipping sauce, and a two-liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. It's Royal Farms' new Tucker's Tenders Meal. It's Justin Tucker's favorite, and at only $19.99, it'll be your favorite meal, too. The new Tucker's Tenders Meal, available only at Royal Farms. Now you can kick back, relax, and eat like a champion. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. In here on GCR as we wind down for hour number one, move into hour number two of the program. Stands here. And a reminder that whatever you're doing this weekend, you're going to enjoy it a little bit more if you have a cold Goose Flights lager in your hand. Goose Flights available all over town. Delicious beer, awesome collector's can. Goose Flights, you can get it in cans at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton. You can get it at Alonzo's on Cold Spring Lane. You can also find cans at all of the state's 
Glory Days Grill locations. So every Glory Days Grill in Maryland has cans of Goose Flights available. And Costas has cans. They have cans right. and six packs at Costas Inn. As does Guilford Hall Brewery in Station North, and six packs and cases available at the Wine Source in Hamden. One ninety-eight from every can sold goes to benefit the Goose Flights Foundation, the work that Tony's family is doing to uh, continue his legacy by providing non-emergency medical transport for those in need. We love Goose Flights. They mean the world to us. We support them, and we want you to support them and just have a delicious beer. If you're getting together with your buddies, whatever it is that you're doing, bring Goose Flights along. If you want to find out more, and if you missed any of those locations, go to PressBoxOnline.com slash Goose Flights, and while you're there, you still have a couple more days to sign up to win thousand dollars in baltimore sports ticket credits wow it's a huge prize huge huge prize you can just wake up one day this season and be like i want to go to the game tonight i'm going to use my credit that's simple pressboxonline.com slash goose flights go sign up right now saying in about 10 minutes we're going to be joined by jeremy fowler from espn jeremy fowler says in a piece that he wrote sort of looking at it was an off-season look for all of the teams in the NFL. Suggested in talking to his sources throughout the league, he believes the Ravens could be pursuing a running back, quote, of pedigree, unquote, this offseason. Is that why they didn't run the ball against the Chiefs? I, they the, didn't have someone the, of pedigree? It's the ironic part of the conversation, right? Like, the, it does not look like Gus Edwards will be back in Baltimore. There was a deadline this week for players who had void years that if you didn't get them signed by Monday – then they were going to count as dead money against the cap next year. And so if you were going to have them on the team, you'd rather have them and not dead money on top of it. It's going to cost you more money to have them on the team. It felt like a deadline. Doesn't mean that things couldn't work out, that Gus Edwards ends up back in Baltimore, but it felt like a reasonable deadline by which they'd, if they were going to bring him back, they'd want to have it done by Monday in order to make that possible. Right. So, and it wouldn't be as much dead money as, say, Kevin Zeitler. Kevin Zeitler, it seems like there's no chance now that he's back based on the amount of dead money that would be involved after the deadline passed for him. But I'm fascinated by this topic because the my initial thought is, and all of a sudden Derrick Henry's been the hot name this week, another one of the sports books that we don't care about because we are, of course, super book people here at GCR. One of the other sports books has... Derrick Henry's, that you can bet on his next team that he'll play for, and the Ravens, by a good margin, are the favorite to be the team for Derrick Henry next year. And I just sort of say, is is that is that the difference? Is that what this team is really prioritizing this offseason? Like, is the difference in their ability to... I, I don't think that I see that at all, that the difference in this team being a Super Bowl champion was improving or upgrading at the running back position. I think that all of us felt very confident about the backs that they had. They just chose not to give them the ball in the biggest game of the season. I'm baffled. I'm really confused by why the answer would be an upgrade, a running back. of. And by the way, there's a boatload of them available this offseason. Yeah. It's nothing but running backs. And the answer might be that there's so many running backs and so few teams. You get one inexpensively. That, that, More, a lot less expensive than you would think. But what, I, Like, what do you think? What was Henry making last year in Tennessee? He was still making, because he restructured. Um, was he making $11, $12 million? Yeah, I think, it was, least, I think yeah. it was more than that, actually. 16? Uh, somewhere in that. I was going to say 14 was going to be my guess. But and what would you think he'd make this year? Like, eight? Um... I'd be hard pressed. I'd be hard pressed Six? to believe he had a four-year, fifty million dollar deal right. with the Titans. So he's making twelve and a half per half season. Million. Okay. Um, I, he, he, maybe. Like, I, I, I think this is going to be a very depressed running back market. Yeah. Like, I just don't see the appetite for teams. I still think Saquon Barkley and Austin Eckler could stand out because they're pass catchers, right? And I know that. I, Austin Eckler had a very disappointing year a year, a year ago, but his skill set is still desirable in what you're looking for if you're going to go after a running back. It's to find something that's as close to Christian McCaffrey as you can find. How do you find a hard runner that's also really a pass catcher? And Saquon Barkley, to me, Austin Eckler kind of stand out of this group as the two guys that kind of present that, right? 
if the Ravens are in the market for a running back, it would make sense for them to be in the market for a between-the-tackles running back because that's what they'd be losing in Gus Edwards. And so Derrick Henry certainly fits the bill of the type of running back that you would need to replace, but Derrick Henry's not just a between-the-tackles. Like, and by the way, it's a foregone conclusion that Dobbins will not be back. It's certainly not a foregone. I, I think that we are operating under the belief that he seemed unhappy and – but I don't know that there's a market for J.K. Dobbins right. at this point. And so is there some world where the Ravens explore the running back market? They don't. They were interested in Derrick Henry, but there's more interest than we thought and, there was going to be. And what's and the kid who got hurt this Keaton year? Mitchell, who to Mitchell, me, right. if he was healthy, you'd be going and saying he's the featured back moving no forward for the Baltimore it, Ravens. But, but what is the prognosis for his availability a training camp next I, the year. way that john harbaugh spoke about it at the end of the year like he was saying we don't think any of these guys are going to linger in the next year right. so beginning a training camp i don't know if that's viable and sometimes john is just you know pre- presenting a right. a rosier picture than what actually is if they had utter confidence in keaton mitchell to me keaton mitchell is your featured back and you are just looking for a, a a sidekick you're looking for a, a complimentary back that you can bring in and and essentially be your gus edwards moving forward um and it to me if that was the case why wasn't it gus edwards like that's the part that i i struggle with i'm like that you had that guy he was i don't know if you saw he was very good at it <laughs> every time you were in goal to go give the ball to gus edwards he's he's good at this so I, I don't know. The running back conversation is just weird to me because my gut tells me any money you spend at running back, you're probably better suited spending that money somewhere else. Like, I just think at this point, yeah. you're going to need a new right guard moving forward. We don't know what's going to end up happening with either one of your tackles. There's still a ri- that risk that either one of them could end up being cut um, before the offseason, before the new year begins. I, you clearly have to do something at edge rush. Like, you whether that's bringing back Jadavion Clowney and Kyle Van Noy or going out and getting someone, like you have to do something at edge rush. If Justin Matabike is going to be on the team with the franchise tag, that's going to be $21 million. It's counting against your cap, likely. Like That's a huge number, and I have no interest in Justin Matabike being let go. So I, I just don't know where any money would be coming from that you would be spending at the running back position. It feels like the wrong priority to have to go into an offseason. Looks like Queen won't be back, correct? Almost certainly. Almost certainly. Okay. I, I mean, boy, Clowney really had – the, the, the question is, Clowney talked a lot about how much he enjoyed playing sure. for the Ravens. Does that have a, a dollar value to him where he might play for a little bit less – because uh, I thought he was a real difference maker last Maybe year. Maybe the same could be said about Van Noy, too, just like that the Ravens were the only team to give him a chance, you know, last season, and maybe that would incline him to... And you'd still be surprised by either one of those around. guys having a huge market just because of their age. Like, But it still seems like they both made money. They, I think they both would be in position to make more money than they clearly made with the Ravens right. last season. But What did Clowney make last year? Like, six? I was going to say four. Four? I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I'll double-check that. I... Uh, it was not significant, uh, whatever, here. I'll tell you in two seconds. Davion Clowney last year made oof. four, four, five, right? Uh, his cap hit was four, five, yes. His, yeah, his base salary was $1.1 $1. 1 million. Okay. But, yes, he but throwing in the signing bonus, throwing in everything, you know, right. he he made four, four and a half million dollars last right. year. Um, I mean, do you think he can make, is it, is it his yearly nut would would go up substantially, or he so can get four he's, years somewhere? He's thirty one. I don't think he can get four years. Three years. I think the top the top would be three, and one of those deals that's like really a two year deal right. that they write up as a three year deal. Like I think that's the top end of what Jadavion Clowney could get at this point, just simply because yeah, as good as he was a year ago, I think his age is a complicating factor yeah. now that prevents him from breaking the bank and creating his market value is seven point two million. Is what they're listing as market value at. Who is no, who Sp- is track Spot track Okay, um, that's a lot. Yes, that's a that's a is. heavy number. Now, if you do a multi-year deal, then you don't have to do all of that at once. And look, I'm definitely in favor of Jadavion Clowney being back in Baltimore yeah. because you got to do something. Something has to happen at edge rush, and 
if you can do better than Jadavion Clowney, by all means, go ahead and do better. But I don't know where the market's come, where the money is coming to, from to do that. Certainly not if you're going to be in the market for a running back. It is. It is. I'm, I I keep coming back to. I don't know where this money is coming from yeah, for a running back. Against, they're up against a lot of things, the Ravens this year. And they're going to presumably do some restructures. And even Lamar Jackson's deal already one year in. You can restructure and get a few million dollars in the process. Um, they can do some restructures right now to clear up a little bit more money, but if they come to me, I'll restructure. How much are you willing to play for next year, Stan? I play for very little money. Would you be willing to play for a million dollars? No, I, no, I you're mean, not willing to do that. Just to pay my health insurance at this can't, point, you can't afford that. I understand that thought process. Um, it, it will be interesting to see, obviously, how this plays out, and we will presumably start to see some dominoes fall in the next week or two. Because before the new, they have to get under the cap before the new year begins. The word this week is that the cap might go up slightly more than people thought it was going to go up. It might end up being in the neighborhood of two hundred fifty million dollars. And what was it last year? Two forty. Uh, no, I think you're right. I think it's two thirty. I think the expectation was it was going to be at two forty three, two forty four, something like that. And now the thought process is it might be more like two forty eight, two fifty. We'll end That's up being where the cap. get some of it. Yeah. It would be very good news, yeah. obviously, for a team like the Ravens if that were to be the case because they're going to be up against it otherwise. But it also means that every other team has a little bit more money to spend as well yeah. to try to pursue a Geno Stone or a Jadavion Clowney right. or a player like that on the open market. The the They still have a couple of weeks to make, or I, I guess at this point less than two weeks, to make the decision about Justin Matabike. I, I can't fathom. I, I mean, he's got to be on the team some way or another next year. He's got to be... You can't that that guy is too good yeah. for you to put your arms up and say, well, we he's just going to cost a lot of money. We can't pay him like you. That guy has to be on your team. Come hell or high I would water. Agree. You, you, and it be it would stink for cap reasons for it to be under the franchise tag just because you have to absorb all of it at once when mm-hmm. it's the franchise tag. But man, it, it can't be that he's not here. He has got to stick around and be a centerpiece moving forward. I have made peace, to your point, that Patrick Queen's going to be gone. I've made peace that Geno Stone is going to be right. gone. That, that he's just going to price himself out of Baltimore. Had too good of a season. And there's probably a few more that will price uh, themselves. Almost certainly the case. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what the Ravens might be doing this offseason. Joining us now here on GCR. No? Okay. Technology is letting us down today. I don't know. That damn technology. I don't know what's happening. You know, the phones weren't working yesterday. Not our phones, like the globally. AT&T. AT&T was down yesterday. And I've been telling John for years to use Verizon. It's time, uh, right? Yeah. Like, it's time. You can't you can't have the phone going down for, for a couple of hours. And the panic that sets in from people now. Like, when I don't know when you go through this where, like, your internet is out for a minute. You're oh, like, it's like you're what, cut what, off from the world. A hundred per, what do you yeah. do? How do you live in those circumstances? Uh, we had a weather thing at, at my house last week. Or no, um, a, tr- a, a power line went down. And on Sunday afternoon, our power was out for like an, an hour. And in, within five minutes, I said, I have to leave. <laughs> I can't I be here. Go, right? I have to be somewhere else. What am I going? What is the point of existing in these circumstances? I got to get out of here. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about what the Ravens might be doing this offseason season. He is, of course, an ESPN NFL insider. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Mr. Jeremy Fowler, who's with us now here on GCR. Jeremy, it's Glenn, and uh, Stan Charles is in studio with me this morning. Always appreciate you taking the time for us. Thanks so much for doing this. Hey, Glenn and Stan, no problem. So, so I think a lot of people, Jeremy, were fascinated by, and I know that it wasn't necessarily a report as much as you were just looking at what the offseason could look like for every team in the NFL. And this nugget that you threw it about the Ravens, that in talking to folks around the league, that the Ravens could be looking for a running back of pedigree, of which there are quite a few on the market. Were you surprised when you started hearing that from folks around the league? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, you know, I know that they've done their legwork on a lot of the top guys. And it, price point will be a big part of it. If the running back market gets to $10 million or more, they probably won't be involved. But traditional logic of the last few years says that you know it could be a low number because running backs have suffered in free agency so baltimore could certainly take advantage gus edwards is a free agent they could bring him back Uh, but right now you just have justice hill and keaton mitchell who's coming back from an acl so they have to get some help i think they're going to look at some high-end help potentially um you know they'll 
at least be steady in the likes of Saquon and Tony Pollard and some of those guys as options. Jeremy, where do you think right now the club stands or the player stands uh, with the club in the case of J.K. Dobbins? You know, that's a good question. I know um, certainly the, the door is open to potentially come back. They've had a good relationship. You know, they even were going to talk about an extension before he got hurt. So it's a, it's a player they value, but, you know, the injuries are severe enough where there probably has to be a little bit of a waiting period typically when guys get hurt and need all offseason to recover for most of the offseason. They wait to sign in free agency. So that could be the case here. Um, you know, but this is a player who certainly has – top 10 to 15 running back potential when he is healthy. So, um, you know, I think they'll keep it on the radar and they'll keep the lines of communication open on that. Let me go back because you mentioned a couple of names. The name that you didn't mention is the one that obviously got a ton of traction this week, and I'm not really sure where it came from originally, and that's Derrick Henry. When you talk about the price point here, like is it practical that Derrick Henry could be in the Ravens' consideration? Yeah, I mean, I think it's practical, practical for all these guys, all these running backs, Henry included. And, uh, Henry, I believe, is one of the backs that they've studied. You know, they've, they've, all teams kind of create a list of free agent potential options at a position, you know, and then they work from there and you know, they run it by their scouts and their coaches and then they kind of whittle it down based on who they want to target, sort of like the draft. And, you know, in this case, Henry's in that mix. I After asking around, though, I think the fit could be difficult because he's so eye formation heavy in his career hmm. and the Ravens do so much out of the gun. So not that they can't work and, or that Henry couldn't adjust. And certainly he would be crucial for them on, you know, short yardage, tough down, uh, dictate the pace of the game, red zone, all those things. Um, but I, I think like a Saquon Barkley pr- probably would be more of a dangerous option for them because of all you could do with him and Lamar together. Oh. You know, so but uh, I, th- I do think Henry's on the radar, and not to not to say that they're going to go sign Saquon Barkley just because he might have a lot of money there ready to go. You know, so but I just think those are the options that are being discussed and kicked around. What kind of dollars do you think it would take? You know, in other words, what do you think when it's all said and done, Barkley pulls down uh, when he signs? Yeah, I mean the market's got to dictate that. I, I just have a hard time seeing any running back in free agency getting more than $10 million a year, um, even if a player like that deserves it. You know, but Barkley's been in the league six years now. Um, you know, teams will get concerned about that tread a little bit. But I could see, like, a two for 20, three for 30 type deal for him. Maybe get it up there with incentives, you know, get the number looking a little better. Um, but it's it really the market has to dictate. And, and next week at the combine will be a big barometer as to what teams are really willing to spend there. He is Jeremy Fowler from ESPN. He's with us here on GCR. Jeremy, I, I feel like the, the interesting part of the conversation for me and why I am a bit surprised isn't because like the Ravens don't necessarily have a need at running back. It's more I, – I, I always thought that once they got into the Lamar Jackson contract era, they were going to have to take certain positions and say, we, we just can't spend there. And given how up against it they are and they yeah. got to make this decision with Justin Matabike – I feel I feel like it's a warranted conversation to have about whether it's wise to spend like I, I like I think these are all great players, but can a team in a quarterback contract era afford to be investing money on any running back at this point? It's... Right. Totally a fair question, which is why I think that they'll they'll still bargain hunt or try to convince somebody to go compete for a championship and take a little less. You know, that's sure. kinda how these things go. I mean, look at the Chiefs. Like, the Chiefs are doing homework on a lot of the top wide receivers, but I still don't expect them to spend big there necessarily. I mean, maybe, uh, but, you know, they're going to sort of uh, bargain shop a little bit and, you know, talk to teams about, hey, look, we're winning big. Come here and win. Um, That's kind of how it goes sometimes. Or, like, they might wait for one of the top five running backs to have to twist in a win for a week in free agency. Like, if they get to that second week and didn't get a deal done and the musical chairs are up on the big money, then they can come take advantage, you know? So there are ways to do it. Um, you know, the Matabuke thing is fascinating because he's a guy you probably don't want to let out of the building. No. But tra- traditionally, they have let those guys out of the building, at least on defense. You know, you've seen, you know, the – who did they re-sign? The Brandon Williams, I think they re-signed. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But they, they – 
they don't do a lot of those. They let those guys walk and they get the comp picks for them and, and they call it a day. So I think that's changed a little bit with Eric DaCosta being in the seat, in the GM seat, where, you know, they just play it on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. And maybe they franchise tag him, but I, I don't know. I mean, they, they've had such success drafting, you know, that they can hope for the next man up to, to produce that way. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, Jeremy, but, like, they have nothing at edge rush right now, right? Like, you know, the Clowney and Van Noy were um, – were miracles a season ago, and now we'll see what their future ends up leading for them. And if either one of them might be back in Baltimore, they've gotten very little out of you know Adafi Owe. They've barely seen David Ajabo on the field, and I get that Matabuke is not a an edge rusher, but someone who made such an impact in the sacks department. And when you have so little there otherwise, like I I I just can't fathom how you let that player end up walking. Yeah, it's certainly possible, and I think. You know, some of the people who have coached him would probably say the same thing. You know, <laughs> right. they knew going into this year uh, that he was going to eat. He was going to have a big year. Like they, they felt that. They knew that. He had been building up to that. So they don't really look at him as a one-year wonder in that way. Um, it just depends on what the price point is going to be. I mean, he's going to be well over twenty million dollars a year, and it's just no. I get it. I don't know if they want to go there or not. Jeremy, heard anything on Odell Beckham's chances of returning to the Ravens? Because it seems like, with the, which is stretched as they are cap-wise, that would be one place to get some money out of. Yeah, for sure. I would be, I'd say, mildly surprised if he's back. Um, I'd never say never. I think his experience there was good, but his target share is pretty low. I don't know the numbers in front of me, yeah. but this is a guy who still wants the ball. He wasn't getting it, you know, and that's, for better or worse, that's been the issue in Baltimore is receivers go there and, and their careers suffer a little bit, you know, that receiver, that's just a bit the way it's been. I mean, Hollywood Brown wanted out of there. It's tough, and it's that's sort of the weird um, existence of Lamar Jackson, great player, two-time MVP, but yet it's hard to get receivers there. Now, that's changing a little bit with Todd Munkin, I think, and, and the way they're running their system, but... You know, Odell, I think he can go somewhere else and be like a full-time slot receiver now with his size and strength. I don't know that he's the guy you can put on the outside and just win all the time anymore. <clears throat> but I was talking to a few coaches. If they put him in the slot, he'll catch 80 or 90 passes somewhere else. To, that, that's probably attractive to him. To your point, it was 64 targets over 14 games. Like, you know. It, yeah, that's rough. Yep, that's it, rough. no doubt. But, you know, like, obviously, I think the Ravens probably hope that Odell, Odell Beckham just loves uh, Lamar Jackson and – Appreciates the experience, but I get everything that you're saying. Um, I, one other guy that I feel like is a big talking point for us here in Baltimore going into the offseason, Jeremy, is Ronnie Stanley. Have you gotten any sense for, like, if the Ravens really would have the appetite for moving on? I mean, this is the difficult part is you could save a lot of money if you do it post June 1, but you're still you're going to be out you're not going to have a left tackle at that point and that's a very difficult position to go try to get money saved at I don't know that there is a big market for Ronnie Stanley maybe he's willing to work with you because with all of the injuries the last couple of years maybe there isn't a a big Ronnie Stanley market if he were to be released by the Ravens yeah that one's interesting because they've They've held on to him for this long, right? They let him fight through the injuries. They could have cut him before if they wanted to be aggressive, and they never did. And I'm not saying he's the same player, uh, but he's still uber talented. You know, if he can give you a decent amount of snaps every year, those snaps are probably going to be pretty good, you know? Um, I know he's not the same guy because of the injuries, but it's just to, to replace them would cost just as much or more right now unless you can get a really good tackle in the draft that they feel. And it is a good tackle draft. Right. Like high in the draft, I mean, you could have six or seven offensive tackles going round one. So if they want to tap into that, I could maybe see it, you know. It, it worked with the center they drafted in the past. But you're already losing Kevin Zeitler. Um, I just I don't necessarily see them moving on. I know they can save a lot, but if I had to gauge right now, I think they'd give it one more shot. What's what's that number they could save if they did? If it's fifteen, but it's post. If they do it, if they designate it as a post June one, right? So they wouldn't have that money for the start of free agency, okay. but they could budget around it moving forward if they were to do it that way. Um, I, if I could, I know it's away from personnel. Just Jeremy, one thought in in talking, a lot of people in Baltimore were. Really, let, and I'd say that Stan Charles, my partner, is one of them. We're really bummed about losing Mike McDonald and the thought that maybe you're watching, you know, the next great coach 
leave your building to go somewhere else. I wonder what the thought was around football about just how good Mike McDonald might be and how much of a loss this will prove to be for the Baltimore Ravens. Well, it's a massive loss. I mean, he is really sharp. All you hear is just how smart he is, how he relates to players. He's kind of the total package. The only complaint I heard about him in the interview process with other teams, they said they were blown away by his interview. He was amazing. But their offensive staff, or the, the staff he had put together, had some questions. Hmm. Um, so if you were a team trying to hire an offensive-minded head coach, you probably were turned off a little bit by Mike McDonald. Now Seattle was open to a defensive head coach. But now his coordinator is coming from college with limited to no NFL experience. That is a question mark. But outside of that, he was very coveted. He's got he checked a ton of boxes. Um, you know, what the belief is in some league circles that Washington wanted him as well, and there was a bit of a bidding war. So, you know, certainly the Ravens were bracing to lose him potentially. They knew he was going to be a hot candidate. And they obviously think very highly of Zach Orr. I think you're seeing that now with young linebackers, like with Danico Ryan. Yeah. Right? He still looks like he could keep playing. Uh, Antonio like Pierce. Guy, but yet here he is with successful head coach. Antonio Pierce, like those linebackers are coaches on the field. And so they're looked upon as really good coordinators and head coaches now. So I think that's, that's Harbaugh trying to get ahead of it. I think I think Orr had other options, Green Bay being one. So, you know, they just felt like they had a natural fit there and, you know, to move on. But it's their question, certainly, because the way McDaniel or uh, McDonald structured that defense and, you know, him calling blitzes at the right time and uh, being Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel type offenses was really impressive. Jeremy, a uh, quick question. Who do you think yeah, are... Last, last one, guys, and i got to run. Yeah. All right, la- re- yeah, real quick, lastly, who do you think ends up out in Seattle from that Ravens defense? Uh, that's a good question. I was, I mean, maybe like a Geno Stone or if they – because I don't know that Seattle will keep both safeties. they got Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams at a big safety number. Uh, cap wise, they could save a lot of money there. So, do they want to go younger at safety? I could see that. I don't know about Matt Abuke if they want to spend there. But they got Leonard Williams there already, who has a similar function that they could re sign possibly for cheaper. So, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a slam dunk. You know, you could always bring Clowney there, bring him back. But it's going to depend on the money. At Jay Fowler, ESPN, of course, is how you follow him. Is there anything we can plug for you, Jeremy? Uh, no, no. That, that was. Good right there. I appreciate it. Jeremy, thanks for taking the time for us. We really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, guys. Have a good day. Jeremy Fowler, ESPN NFL insider with us here in GCR. Again, I think the takeaway there is he says if it gets up in the neighborhood of $10 million and the Ravens probably balk at it, and I I would say they better. (laughs) I don't know where that money is coming from. They'd be spending that type of money on a running back. I still come back to. I just almost whatever the money is going to be. If it's the next layer of the market, if it's a Zach Moss type, if it's a Devin Singletary type that you want to have as a complimentary, like, hey, the plan is Keaton Mitchell, if he's healthy, he's our explosive back. We'd even be willing, to your point, to give another look at J.K. Dobbins, and we believe in his skill set if he can be healthy, and Justice Hill's always the emergency option who is going to be on the team because he's a special teams guy. That we have, we have a core of guys we think we just need – someone who's more of a change of pace back to throw into the mix, I'd be completely fine with that. I, I, The top end of the running back market to me is not going to prove to be the difference in whether this team gets past the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs. Like, <laughs> I just... I mean, particularly... They sure didn't seem to think uh, that the running back position was particularly important uh, this year against I, But the, I, I come back... I think that you could have gotten past the Chiefs with the I, running backs I, that you I had do. this year. You just didn't do... I. By the way, that has been, like, one argument that's been made by Ravens fans is, well, if you spend money on a running back, then you have to give them the ball. Right. And so it's going to force, you know, Todd Monk in, in the biggest games to make sure somebody gets the ball. But you also don't want to create a scenario where you're tying someone's hands and saying... Well, we saw, we spent X amount of dollars on a player, so you better every week in that game plan draw up twenty touches for that player. Like I, I don't want that either. I'm I'm still very confused by this entire con it's clearly real. Like the Ravens clearly are poking around at the running back market and at least considering the possibility yeah. Of a running back upgrade. I, Jeremy Fowler's not making that up. And look, they spent, I think it was like 15 on Beckham last year. It's true. If yeah. Beckham's not there and you, you get Barkley at 
eight and a half to nine. Are the Ravens a better team? I think yes is the answer. I, Barkley is interesting because his skill, he's a more dynamic yeah. player, right? But I would say, is the cost of that Matabike? Because if the cost of that is Matabike, then, then I'm sticking with Matabike. What are we doing here? Yeah. Like, what is this conversation? Yeah. If any conversation is, we're going to update upgrade at running back, but we're going to have to bail on Matabike, I... Unless you and I sat down privately with Eric DaCosta right. and he said, I am so confident that we'll get one of these three, you know, pass edge rushers mm-hmm. in the draft. You know, um, I mean, look, he's a very confident personnel guy. There's he no doubt about that. He can pull some magic and, out of his and hat, there and is, he does. And there is an argument that based on the offseason that he had a year ago, that we should be inclined to say, hold up, let him cook when yeah. it comes to Eric DaCosta because. We all question, like, hey, what are, you, what are you doing? And then, as it turns out, almost everything was a hit. Odell Beckham, I get it. It wasn't overwhelming, but he was a good fit here. Yep. It worked out. Jadavion Clowney, Kyle Van Noy were un- unfathomable hits, given the circumstances when they came in. Arthur Mallett proved to be a hit. And it, Ronald Darby was a hit. Like, there is an argument that we should look at this and say. Just say trust Ozzy. Uh, trust uh, Eric. Uh, like yeah, the way that once upon a time Ozzie. you used to say, just trust Ozzy. Like, that would be. I, I, there is an absolute argument for that. Um, that at this point, he has earned the right that you say, all right, if, if he says, let's swim in the deep waters when it comes to running back, then let's listen. And maybe there's an argument for it. I just keep coming back to, I think that money ultimately is better spent elsewhere any money that you're spending at running back to me it feels like you can spend that somewhere else and it would be more beneficial unless you get john harbaugh to sign a pledge that you're that, yeah that no matter you, what no matter <laughs> what we're gonna you get to a playoff that back, game that one back will run 12 times in a playoff game 15 aye, times aye, 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 aye. i still i and i'm still listening on if the market came back on gus edwards again while this yeah deadline passed i gus will end up in a in a Good situation for himself. He's Presumably, a, yes. Yeah. But if it worked out that you get into the market and the market isn't what Gus Edwards thought it was, I, to me, Gus Edwards is exactly what you're looking for. Like, that's the infuriating part about this conversation. Is I'm like, the guy that I want is Gus Edwards. the guy that you had. Right. Like, that's the guy that I'm looking for in this. So I, I'm in a weird place when it comes to this conversation about running backs. All right, it is a a Friday edition of the program. Sam the Fan Charles is here in studio with us. You want to grab a break and we can get that sorted out? Scheduled to be joined by Paul Biancardi to talk about uh, Derek Queen. So let's, let's just grab a break and we'll try to chat with Paul Biancardi next here on GCR. Hey, it's Jeremy Kahn. This postseason, bet in person at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks with locations in Canton and in Towson and enjoy the best in-class sports wagering experience at their state-of-the-art facilities, bringing an unmatched sports betting thrill. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Discover your next favorite beer crafted in the heart of Charm City. At Guilford Hall Brewery, we believe beer should be flavorful and easy to enjoy. Our meticulously crafted lagers and ales are derived from centuries-old European brewing traditions, a staple for both the seasoned beer aficionado or a novice hophead. Experience beer styles that dare to showcase the exceptionality of simplicity. Visit our restaurant and brewery at 1611 Guilford Avenue or view our menu and tap map online at guilfordhall.com guilford hall brewery european tradition baltimore charm make the most out of every day in your toyota rav4 available in hybrid or gas only models a rav4 can get you where you want to go in style check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new rav4s from your local toyota dealer today there's so much focus on sports betting these days but i want to talk about an area that nobody wants to gamble on where you choose to go out and spend your hard-earned dollars to eat the casas inn is no gamble at all the quality on their menu is outstanding and the value is off the charts with a great and varied list of special 
specials Monday through Friday. And the staples of the menu, whether it's salads, burgers, fish, they're all fantastic. And I haven't even mentioned the crabs or crab cakes yet. So check out the menu for yourself at CostasIn.com. When choosing a place to dine, never gamble on the food you put in your belly. The Costas Inn at 4100 North Point Boulevard or call 410-477-1975 for reservations and your steam crab orders. Six chicken tenders made from fresh, never frozen Royal Farms world famous chicken, a family sized order of Western fries, honey mustard dipping sauce, and a two liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. It's Royal Farms new Tucker's Tenders Meal. It's Justin Tucker's favorite, and at only $19.99, it'll be your favorite meal too. The new Tucker's Tenders Meal, available only at Royal Farms. Now you can kick back, relax, and eat like a champion. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. Two dollars of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. One of the things that's definitely wrong with this country is that this dude still has a job somehow, some way. Glenn Clark. Back in here on GCR, Stan the Fan Charles in studio with us. If you think you know high school basketball, you want to prove to everybody how smart you are, then it's time to play Pick'em over at CountySportsZone.com. Go right there, CountySportsZone.com. Pick the winners, earn points to see where you stand on the leaderboard. Only at CountySportsZone.com, presented by your local Toyota dealer. Is there any way we could ask our next guest questions on the air that give us Oh, in insight the, into yeah, that. That's yeah. a good point. I guess we're uh, this is MIAA Championship Weekend, in fact. This uh, this is at UMBC tomorrow is uh, the championship game. So, um, yeah, maybe you can uh, help us out. And uh, Actually, they don't even remember who won the semifinals. i got to go check that right now. Um, I assume. Uh, hang on. I'll try to tell you in two seconds who's playing in the championship. It is... Of course, I can't find it. I'll tell you after we talk to him. All this right. way. Oh, whoa. I totally missed that St. Francis lost. Holy smokes. When they lose? They lost in the quarterfinals to Glen L Country. Jeez, Holy crap. That is. That's a game changer. That is significant. I had no idea that that was the case. Well, I hope Maryland that? didn't sign anybody from St. Francis. <laughs> uh, Mount St. Joe and Archbishop Spalding will play for the A Conference title. They were the winners last night. And that's uh, tomorrow? It is tomorrow at UMBC, yes. What time? Good question, Stan. I, I, I always should have ask prepared. good questions. You do, and then I always feel very silly when I can't go find See, it. See, I know nothing. Yeah, it's but sp- uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow at UMBC for the MIAA Conference Championship. Spalding beat Mount Carmel, who had had sort of a Cinderella run this year, and uh, Mount St. Joe beat Glen Elg Country. So Mount St. Joe and Archbishop Spalding will play in the championship game tomorrow night. The quarterback that Maryland is hot and bothered by with, uh, Malik Washington from March Bishop Spalding, is also one of the top basketball players there. So um, a name that uh, is worth taking a look at. Malik Washington. All right. Joining us now here on GCR, talk a little bit about uh, some basketball recruiting. Maryland landed a significant recruit. Uh, Rankings-wise, one of the most significant recruits that the University of Maryland has ever landed. Joining us now from ESPN, national recruiting analyst, former college basketball coach himself. He is Mr. Paul Biancardi, and he is with us now here on GCR. Paul, it's Glenn Stan Charles here in Baltimore. It's always good to chat with you. Thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes for us. Well, thank you guys for having me. Some big news. Yeah. For Maryland, I know everybody's excited about it, as well they should be. And, and it's on so many le- levels. Well, let me just start with Derek Queen, the player, Paul. Let me just start there before we talk about some of the impact that it could have elsewhere. Exactly what, because there will be, I think I think the last time there was a player this prominent that committed to Maryland, it was Diamond Stone, and it didn't work out so well for the University of Maryland. So <laughs> tell me why Derek Queen is definitely going to be better than Diamond Stone was as a Terrapin. Well, the other kid I would mention, too, for 
Maryland a high profile recruit. Their last five star recruit was uh, Jalen Six. Yep. Smith, if you remember. Um, and I thought he was he was good for Maryland. I really did. Uh, Derek Queen. Let's talk about Derek Queen the person. And I think that's important with a lot of these kids is you know who you're getting as a player and who you're getting as a person because I do a lot of evaluation in terms of their character traits. And when you look at Derek Queen, he came on my board very early as a sophomore. He was top three sophomore in the class, ranked nationally as a sophomore. And sometimes when rankings happen at a young age, kids, parents, coaches have a hard time handling the expectations and keeping perspective. And it, Derek Queen just kept working at it. Uh, and he didn't listen to the uh, voices of negativity that surrounded him over the years. And he, he kept his ranking range, which is really hard to do, guys. So he started as number three, and he's right now number 10 uh, in the country in my poll, in my rankings board. And, again, that's hard to do. That means he put a lot of work into the offseason. He put a lot of work into his high school year. That means he's coachable, competitive, and uh, he's got all the great attributes, I think, uh, to be an excellent player at Maryland. And when you look at him as a player, he's a low post, back to the basket, big man who's a legitimate one-on-one -on -one threat. So if you want to throw the ball inside and get a bucket, and Derek Queen can do that for you. He does it naturally. And what makes him special is that he can pass out of a double team. He can hit a cutter. He understands the skip pass on the weak side. He's a great teammate. Everyone's going to love playing with him. And if you play four out, one in, he's the ideal threat inside because eventually, as he gets older, he's going to need a double team. Paul, is there, from what you know, is there anybody out there that he is that might bring along with him? You know, a lot of times you see a big time player go somewhere and they got yeah. a, a best buddy or something because Maryland needs a little more than just him. Uh, well said. Well said. Uh, they're in the hunt for a point guard in the portal. That's what they told him. That's what they need. Yeah. Obviously, with Jameer, Jameer Young moving on, uh, they need a point guard. And uh, they're going to do everything they can to try to find one. It's way too early to figure out who at this point. But in terms of high school prospects, um, there's only three or four guys left on the ESPN 100. So I don't think there's a high school prospect that he's going to bring with him. Uh, it'll be more so from the portal. Quick question. Last year, if I recall correctly, and I could be off, but I thought they were Maryland was ranked as having had like the 15th best uh, recruiting class last year. Am I in the hunt there with the right number? And what the heck happened? Um, in terms of what happened, you mean they're freshmen. And when freshmen yeah. get together, uh, they look like freshmen. Okay. If you look at the shooting percentages of Deshaun Harris-Smith and Jamie Kaiser, right? Yeah. Their three-point shooting percentages are not good. No. I think I think everyone has to step back and look at what does it mean to be a ranked player. It means that somebody has some outstanding credentials in the game. They have a good resume. They've been very productive. Uh, they've been impactful and at times have dominated against their peers of like talent. And they have an upside to them. Uh, but that upside – it takes a couple of years to blossom uh, and to bloom. Uh, two very good players, Deshaun Harris Smith yep. and Jamie Kaiser. I had them in the top 100. They had J uh, Jonathan Lamote, uh, and then they had Braden Pierce as well. So that class was a top 20 class based on the rankings, based on the stars that the players got, because the team rankings, class rankings, are based on the player rankings. So that Maryland class had quality and quantity, but not all – top players are going to produce right away as freshmen. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so when you see a good recruiting class, you're going to get an injection of talent that can help your current program. And then over time, that class will grow together, bring in more new players, hopefully, and then they'll gel and start to you know flex their muscles within the conference. Paul, in a power conference, you need power players. I, I want to come back to Derek Queen specifically, but just to, to continue that thought, right? If Maryland yeah. were to land a a significant point guard in the portal, what you think might be possible from Harris Smith or Jamie Kaiser moving forward? Again, we have to say presuming they stick around because this is college basketball right, now, and go. you know every yeah. every every player could leave at any moment. But presuming they stick around, if you add it, adding in a Derek Queen now, 
do you start to say to yourself, this is the foundation of a team that has the potential to take a step forward next year? Oh, there's no question about it. When you look at the foundation, that's, that's what every program needs is a foundation. You just don't know who's going to be in that foundation. Right. You just said it. Who's coming back? The, the big question in college basketball for years was who's coming in. Now it's who's coming back. Right. You have a pretty good idea who's coming in uh, based on high school recruiting. You don't have an idea yet based on the portal. Uh, but so far early in the portal, you look at the history, you look at the, uh, you know, the, the resume of the portal, there's going to be a lot of players in there. There's going to be players trying to transfer up. There's going to be players that will transfer you know, flat across power conferences. So there's going to be a choice, but it doesn't mean you just go find a point guard. You have to find the player and the person who fits your program. Uh, And there has to be a need. And then there has to be a situation where they get along with and they know the teammates they're going to play with. Uh, It's it's shopping and evaluating, but it's at a high level. Paul Biancardi from ESPN is with us here on GCR. Paul, I I wonder if you could, because about Queen specifically, one of the most fascinating parts to me about him is – He's not a stretch player. Like, he's not a jump shooter. He's not, you know, in, in this era of basketball, if you're seven feet tall, you're a guard anymore, right? Like, he's not that. And yet, he's also a really good free throw shooter. Like, that to me, it, it, it not take nothing away from Juju Reese, who at one point was a good free throw shooter. I'm not really sure what happened there. But, like, to me, it sounds like that's such a lethal combination of someone who wants to do their work inside who's not interested in, well, I'd rather be a jump shooter because that's what's going to get me to the NBA, and yet when every team says, okay, well, we'll just go foul you, he says, cool, I'm going to go make my free throws. Like This to me sounds like the almost the perfect way that you would describe a big man at, at this level. He's the ideal big man, and he's not concerned about how the game's played because when you're really good, and Derek Queen is really good, and he's impactful in games at this level. He's one of the best players in the country in a class of 2024 that's really strong, especially at the top. It's the combination of his hands. He catches everything. He has secure hands. He rebounds with two hands. He has incredible touch. He can score over either shoulder inside. His footwork for his size is nimble. His instincts with his back to the basket to locate a defender and the help side defense, make a move or throw it out. That's what really makes him special, guys. He is an outstanding passer as a big man. He's got Jokic-type passing ability, and it's not just from the low post. He can make passes from the high post, and he's a willing passer. means he's willing to give up the ball. He's an accurate passer, and he's easy to play with. And at the same time, uh, he's a real legitimate threat to score a basket. Good rebounder, gets about eight now in the high school level. He had many, many double-double games. And I'm going to tell you something else about Derek Queen that I want you to keep an eye on when he gets there. A lot of guys his size play what they call drop coverage in ball screen situations, which means they stay between the rim and the ball. They don't get up and hedge. Derek Queen at Montverde Academy, watch him play in these games on TV, on ESPN. Watch him in the McDonald's game. He can hedge a ball screen. And he does it really well for a guy that, you know, is, is 200 and I don't know what he is now, 40 pounds, 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, he can hedge a ball screen. So he brings a lot to Maryland uh, inside. He's easy to play with. And I think they're going to get a really good point guard because they have Derek Queen. Paul, I got two quick things for you. Uh, and one of them is you know this kid pretty well. It sounds like you've known him for a while. What do you think was the deciding factor why he chose Maryland? Well, I can tell you it came down to Maryland and Indiana. I think a lot of people knew that. Uh, He he really had four schools for a long time. Kansas and Houston were part of that mix. And he was serious about all four schools. He took his recruiting uh, very seriously. And he loved both programs, Indiana and Maryland. To me, speaking to him, all these months and and obviously years knowing him, he's a homebody, meaning he loves being at home. He has pride in Baltimore. He wants to play with his former teammates uh, at St. Francis. He wants the local school to be great. 
uh, even though he went away to school at Montverde, he is understanding at Montverde what winning is all about. He's been there since his sophomore year, and he's paid his dues at Montverde. And I think he truly wants to come back home and make Maryland great in basketball. And I think that was the deciding factor. Last thing I have for you is Reese. Uh, I've watched him now for, I think, three years at Maryland. Uh, to me, an exceedingly talented player, but an exceedingly frustrating player. Where, where do real, real basketball analysts see his career right now? Well, I mean, look, he's productive in many ways, and I think that's important. Um, I think no matter what year that you are in college, freshman year or senior year, there's always room to improve. And, you know, look at the scores of these games, okay? You're seeing blowouts. You're seeing uh, upsets. And you can't – you scratch your head, you can't figure it out. I mean, he, he's blocking shots. I think he's been active in that department for Maryland. Uh, he's scoring the ball. He's not a great shooter, obviously. He doesn't shoot it well from the outside. His free throw – has gotten um, worse over time. And a lot of that has to do with what you do in the off season. So for me, it's for him, it's about conditioning in the off season, taking care of your body, doing the skill work that's necessary and being dedicated in the off season, because that's what makes you a player during the season. I mean, but guys, I mean, this productivity level, uh, the last time I checked was really good. It was 19 points and 10 plus rebounds a game. His field goal percentage uh, it's pretty strong. So, I, I mean, I think he's a guy who can do a lot uh, in the future. Uh, his, his points actually were 13 points a game. Excuse me. be really interesting to see him and Derek Queen on the floor together, obviously. Oh, it's it's no a, a heck of a fascinating – yeah, right? That's a fascinating that's, front. That, that, that's going to be exciting. You're going to have two – you can play three out, two in with those two guys, and you'll destroy teams on the offensive end. The question will be how do you guard with Reese and Queen? And I'm telling you, Queen can move his feet a lot faster uh, than people realize. So, Paul, before we let you go, I'm going to follow up on what Stan asked. Is there the possibility for this to become a transformative moment for Kevin Willard at Maryland landing a Derrick Queen that now all of a sudden their eyes opened and there might be a change in how people view Maryland? Or is it almost like Jalen Smith, unique circumstance, kid from here that you were able to land – and, and, and we shouldn't read too much into it more than just you were able to get the kid that was from here that wanted to stay here. A little bit of both. I mean, look, having Derek Queen doesn't mean you're going to be in the top three teams in the Big Ten next year. Yep. It just means you have a chance to win games. It's important. Great recruiting gives you hope and excitement for the future, and that's what Derek Queen will give the Turks. That's important. Along with returning players, what do those players do in the offseason? How much do they improve? Who comes back? Uh, There's a lot of factors on how a team's going to be this year. If you talk to most coaches in September and October, they don't know how good their team is going to be because they have pieces that have transferred in that hasn't played with their guys yet. But Derek Queen enhances the profile of the program, and he'll attract other good players to play at Maryland. That's uh, Paul Biancardi. Sounds positive. No doubt me. about it. And you had a conversation, of course, with Derek Queen that people can find right now, correct? Yes. Yeah, ESPN.com. We broke the news that he committed yep. uh, to Maryland, and it's on ESPN.com, myself and Jeff Borzello. And on my Twitter page, at Paul Biancardi, we have highlights of him from the high school season. You're going to see a lot more of him at Montverde. They're 28-0 and 0 right now. They're trying to go for history and be the first uh, undefeated team at Montverde, uh, a full season. The last undefeated team was Cade Cunningham and that group, uh, a COVID hit. So there's a lot to still see with Derek Queen. He has the McDonald's All-American game as well at the end of March. Hey, Paul, I know at your age, because I just looked you up, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how close. I'm 10, 11 years older than you. But I, I wonder if you ever crossed paths with Lefty. I have not. No, I never did. Okay. Um, obviously an iconic figure in the game. And, you know, as a young coach, it was, it was guys like him you look up to and you wanted to learn from. And, and we're all sad about his passing. Yep. I had a never, never had a chance to even have a conversation with him 
Um, that's a legend in the game that I, I missed. That is that is a shame because, boy, he was he was an awful lot of fun to have a conversation with. There were a few that were better over the years. Thank you very much, Paul. Paul, yeah, seriously, thanks for taking the time. We really appreciate you doing this. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Coach Paul Biancardi uh, with us here on GCR. Appreciate us. Eh, eh, appreciate yeah, us. I think that might have been uh, – I think who he can, was really. Who can blame I him? I think he was really. You? You think this Stan is uh, Charles twenty three? That's that's who he appreciated. Well, that would be. I appreciate that you can use the code Stan Charles twenty three when you sign up at SuperBook, and if you do, you'll receive up to two hundred fifty dollars in a same day first bet match, win or lose. So if you're betting college hoops this weekend, then I don't know if any of the uh, the lines are up yet for tomorrow. There's a big one over at Towson tomorrow. Big game at Towson as they host Charleston. National TV game, noon tip-off, trying to get a nice crowd. Yeah, they don't have uh, lines up yet for tomorrow. Normally those go up day of. That makes sense. But whatever you're betting this weekend, use the code Glenn Clark 23 or Stan Charles 23 when you sign up, and you'll receive up to $250 in a same-day first bet match, win or lose from Superbook. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what the uh, tidbit is today, Griffin? We'll start winding things down. All right, tidbit. Stan's wise. got uh, Stan's got lunch plans today, so we got to oh, get it. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, tidbit wise, I wanted to start <laughs> with. Uh, oh yes, I want to go with Connor McDavid, who's been having a great stretch here. No goals in his last seven games. Okay. But he has 17 assists. Well, how about that? Third player in NHL history with 17 assists. Weren't we just no talking goals. about Connor McDavid a minute ago, Stan? Weren't you just saying? It's like a, it sounds like a Bob Cousy on ice. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. 17 assists, no goals over a seven-game span. Can you name the other two players? No, not a chance in hell. Well, yeah, one of them, there is a chance in hell. Wayne, Wayne Gretzky. Gretzky. Yes. Three times he did this, Wayne Gretzky. Had a seven-game stretch with him. And then Mark Mario Messier. Lemieux. No, close. Mark, uh, Mark Messier. Jacques okay. Plante. Well, I mean, yeah. Yes. If you just said yes. name the best players in hockey history, I would have gotten there Gump, eventually. Gump Worsley. Gump Worsley is most likely going to be my next guest. Um, Jokic had a 15-15-15 game against the Wizards last night. He had 21-19. Do you, you see the Jordan 15. Poole thing? Uh, he got benched, right? That was, well, <laughs> but there's a lot of people that are wondering if he's point shaving. Oh. He like well, inbounded I mean, a ball directly to the Nuggets, <laughs> like directly. I gotta pull it up. Hannibal. I think uh, I think he's <laughs> just bad. Well, I that's the thing, and you know it's funny. And the team's bad <laughs> because that was my reaction to seeing it. Like it doesn't. And the Nuggets are really good. It doesn't look great, but at the same time, I'm not sure that it looks any different than anything else related. To, hang on a second. I'll I'll show you this video. This is this is Jordan Poole inbounding the ball last night against the Nuggets, and you tell me if you think it looks suspect or not. So here's Jordan Poole. There's the uh, is on. What, uh, what am I searching up here? Or? I think he got confused with what jersey he was. You think that's what it was? Uh, yeah. I mean, he definitely bounced it right to. They both have navy blue in their colors. I get right? it. Old Jordan Poole. So Jokic he became, was passing the ball to the team he wished he was playing uh, That for. part might be true. <laughs> uh, um, this is his fifth such I game. I was so convinced Jordan Poole was going to be a superstar. Like when when uh, it, it, well what, what, in Golden State, like in those first moments, with, uh, Steph Curry. When he was yeah. when he was knocking down those shots in the playoffs, I'm like, dude, this guy is the truth. Yeah. And uh, now it's unbelievable you know, how the tide has turned to the point where, like, we might side with Draymond Green. You know, <laughs> like we it, might understand. You know, him. it's interesting. He really hasn't been the same player since he got punched out by Draymond. But Green. I'm starting to wonder if this is exact what happened. Punch the shot out of him. The, yeah. He doesn't pay attention during timeouts. He's on it. The, the Jordan Poole video that got sent around earlier this year of like he is as disconnected from basketball as you could possibly imagine. And you do start to wonder yeah. if, in hindsight, this is what happened that Draymond Green, as much as we all think Draymond Green's a clown, and he is, he's a clown. But he is going to be in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He is a four time champion. He's all of those things. And you wonder, in hindsight, if what happened wasn't that Jordan Poole was pulling his S and Draymond Green had enough of it. And Jordan Poole, it just, and I'm not, it doesn't excuse it. I'm not trying to give Draymond Green a pass for it. But I think a lot of us. I mean, if that were the case, this kid would be. Beat the yeah, hell. every day, every yeah. day, just beat down. You just punch him out. I, I want to make it abundantly clear. I'm not suggesting that it's okay that Draymond Green punched Jordan Poole, uh. but you, I just think that we all have different perspective about how it might have played out than we did at the time. That's all. 
That's the only way that I feel. At the time, remember, we were like, well, dude, if I'm the Warriors and I got to pick one of these cats, I'm picking Jordan Poole. Makes way more sense that that wasn't the case. Uh, it is his fifth such game of 15-15-15. Um, I want to see if you can name all the guys that have done it. Mul- there are six guys that have done had multiple triple doubles of 15-15-15. Only six. Actually, there's Only there's six? nine to- or uh, yeah nine total that have ever done it. Sorry, ten total. Bill Walton. Not Bill Walton has never had a 15-15-15 game. Oscar Robertson. Not the Big O. It's kind of weird. He's like the king of triple doubles. Um, pass it enough. Yeah. I, I don't. Th- Jason Kidd only because he gets a lot of triple doubles, but I don't. You'd be right. Jason okay. Kidd has done it twice. One of the six with multiple. It's kind of wild. Any of them a little older, like back in the 60s? Um, No, actually, yeah, all of them are relatively them are. Uh, modern. modern. George George Gervin. Not Gervin. Too too far. The Iceman. No. Magic. Uh, Yes, Magic Johnson, twice. Larry Bird. Larry Bird. He done, did it once. Wait, what? So, so, so there's 10 guys total right. that have ever done it, so might as well do all And 10. Jokic is one of them. Bird He's is one of them. Magic Johnson is one of them. Correct. So we got seven more to go. And Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook has the most. Nine games nine of 15, games. 15, 15, 15. Makes sense. Um, that shocks me what, that Oscar Roberts. And I, really, the Oscar Robert thing, Roberts thing is wild. I, it, Russell Westbrook, it's going to be so weird for history to try to figure out Russell Westbrook, man. Like, it's going to be one of the most puzzling – I mean, it, everything about him. He was Le, so Le, much fun to watch. LeBron. Uh, LeBron? Uh, no, not LeBron. Hmm. And just to repeat it again, what is it again that they've done? 15 that, points, 15 rebounds, 15 assists, all in the same game. James Harden. James Harden, done it once. One. That's a good get. Um, Will Chamberlain. Uh, not Will. Giannis. Giannis did it once. So there's still more people that have done it more than there's still yes there's all three guys that have done it twice. One of them three times. I mean the problem is everybody else you're thinking of is not a complete player. Who was that guy with the Celtics? Paul um, Pierce. Paul no, Pierce. Uh, not Paul Pierce, but you're th- there's another Celtic that played with Paul Pierce that you that would uh, be that would be on this Garnett? list. Garnett. Not Garnett. Rondo. Rajon Rondo had Rajon one game Rondo. of 15, 15, 15. I would have we, we, we would have been here right. for weeks. He had 20 assists. Without me guessing Rajon Rondo. So I get an assist. You do get an Cause, assist. Cause yes, you guess Paul Celtic. Pierce. Yeah, I would have never gotten there otherwise. So how many more are there? One, two. Two more. Only two more. All right, help us get there. Because Stan's got um, They're both active. Both active. So both active. Right. Yes. Um, I don't think it's Durant. Not Durant. Harden. No, we guessed, we yeah, got we Harden. Did, we did get James oh, Harden. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Jokic. Uh, we are, no, we started yeah, with Jokic. Jokic. Doncic. Luka Doncic, yes. Right, he's yeah. done it three times. And another, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's European. Ta- he's done it three times? Right? Doncic, Doncic. How about Draymond? Three. Not Draymond. Euro- he is European, just European? like Jokic. And, uh, oh, okay. Doesn't end, doesn't end in itch, though. And he's still active? Yes. Very good. I don't think Wen Binyama has done it that much yet. No, he hasn't. Uh, a European player whose name doesn't end in itch. <laughs> <laughs> that's my hit for you. He's a non itch. It's really player. difficult, man. You've really, really pinned me up against the wall here. He is Lithuanian. It's Lithuanian. Litho- oh, Sabonis. Yes, Demonte Sabonis. Sabonis has done it twice. I wouldn't have gotten good, it without yeah. Lithuanian. Very that good, would yeah. never have happened. And I can't believe that Sabonis. I didn't realize that he was that. I right. still can't believe Oscar Roberts. It's that game. that one's the, the he wildest. never got the fifteen rebounds. I mean, <laughs> not never, but he didn't do it. In wild. Game. That is wild. All right, uh, Tubular is brought to you by Goose Flights. Whatever you're doing this weekend, it'd be better with Goose Flights. Delicious beer, all sorts of places all over town. Cans and Sixers of the Wine Source in Hamden. Sixer, sorry, can't, I said it wrong. Wait, you got your Sixers hand over the logo. Do I? I'm sorry. Sixers and Cases at the Wine Source in Hamden. Cans and Sixers at Costas Inn, as well as at Guilford Hall Brewery. Cans alone at all of the Maryland locations of Glory Days Grill. As Seven well as, locations. That's right. correct. And the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook and Alonzo's on Cold Spring Lane. Go pick up your Goose Flights. 198 from every can sold goes to the Goose Flights Foundation. Pressboxonline.com slash gooseflights in order to find out more. Watched uh, something since it's totally tubular. Yes. 
Got something that's going to score points with your wife. Oh? Netflix. 14 episodes, but very, very uh, watchable because they're like 20 minutes an episode. It's called One Day. I saw something about One Day. We it's talked about it very, here a couple weeks ago. What is One Day? It's It follows a couple the same day every year. Okay. Like for about 15 years Okay. In Anybody in it? The- no. A guy named Leo Woodle. And the girl's name I can't remember. She's sort. It looks like she's um, uh, Pakistani, or okay. you know, she might be British, Pakistani background. I forget her name. F- really, really well done. All right, all right. And one your wife day. will. You'll say, "Hey, Stan mentioned this." Uh, all right, he's, you know. All right. Um, here's what's coming up this weekend. Uh, today, ESPN Plus, Towson St. Joe's Lacrosse at 4 o'clock. And then uh, Mount St. Mary's Hoops host St. Peter's at 7. Maryland Baseball takes on Texas Santa Corpus Christi. This is some preseason tournament they're playing, and that's 7 o'clock on Flow Sports. Uh, everything else tonight, uh, you go to glennclarkradio.com. Tomorrow, as I mentioned, Charleston Towson, noon, CBS Sports Network. That's a biggie. That's uh, that's at noon. ESPN Plus, Penn State Navy lacrosse at noon. Hopkins Carolina lacrosse at noon. Rutgers Loyola lacrosse at 1. I'll have that one for you. UMBC New Hampshire hoops at 1. Norfolk State Coppin at 4. And that's it for ESPN Plus tomorrow. Maryland lacrosse tomorrow. Host Princeton at 2 o'clock on Big Ten Network Plus. Morgan State's at Howard tomorrow at 4 in hoops. And UMBC's at Mount St. Mary's tomorrow at noon in lacrosse. That's on mountathletics.com. Maryland Pitt baseball tomorrow at 3 on Flow Sports. Stevenson lacrosse at Christopher Newport. That's a big one tomorrow, 4 o'clock. You can watch on Christopher Newport's website. Sunday, Maryland Rutgers hoops at noon on Big Ten Network, followed by Maryland Ohio State women's hoops at 2. ESPN Plus on Sunday, Loyola BU hoops at 2. Holy Cross Navy hoops also at 2. And Flow Sports for Maryland, Washington baseball at 3. Orioles spring training does indeed get underway this weekend. Tomorrow, 1 o'clock on Masson, Orioles Red Sox. Corbin Burns on the mound for the Birds. I'll take and the you, Orioles. Oh, yeah? You're, yeah, you're actually going to put American dollars on I think they win. Okay. That's a, do it at sport. I do Super realize Bowl. Corbin Burns may only pitch like One, an inning. An inning. I mean, they're probably going to score 10 runs in that. It. Like, the Orioles will score 10 Garrett runs. Garrett Whitlock is going for the Red Sox in the uh, spring oh, yeah. training. Uh, Whitlock. They mash Whitlock. On Sunday, uh, you'll be able to listen to the game on BAL or 98 Rock, or you can watch it if you're an MLB TV subscriber. It's at 1 o'clock as they take on the Pirates. I think that's all that really matters this week, and everything else you can go to glennclarkradio.com and find City, it there. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 sure. yeah. Non-sports. Uh, Formula One, uh, F1 Drive to Survive is back, season six. Sure. On Netflix. And Jenny Slate's got a comedy special on Prime Video. I love Jen- I'm a big Jenny Slate fan. Uh, they're doing a, a new adult animation show on Prime Video as well. The Second Best Hospital in the Galaxy. I don't know. Kerry Calkins in it. Kiki Palmer, Maya Rudolph, Natasha Leone. Okay, it's an interesting yeah. cast. Interesting cast. I don't, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't look like... Maybe it'll stick. Two more episodes of The Dynasty on Apple TV+. Plus. It's the Patriots thing that I don't care about. Correct. Um, uh, that, new episode is of- that The Dynasty with John Forsythe and Linda No, Evans? not at all. No? No, <laughs> it's about Tom, the Tom Brady Patriots. Oh, that yeah. Dynasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. Um, new episode of Curb on Sunday night. American Idol as well on Sunday night. And then Saturday uh, is the, Sa- the SAG Awards. Streamed ah, live on Netflix at 8 sure. p.m. Followed by, uh, then on NBC is SNL with Shane Gillis. Right. And 21 Savage. Returning to I SNL. thought last week's Curb was one of the top three to four it was very uh, good. in the history of the it show. It was very good with the shorts. and the, It was very, <laughs> very good. All right, Stan the Fan, you're back in action on Monday? Back in action Monday. We had, by the way, Ross was out of town yep. for a medical situation in his family. Um but we had a uh, very interesting – Luke came up with the idea along with Zach Seidel. We had the baseball coach from yeah, UMBC, Liam, Bow- Liam Bowen, on, who was uh, really good, very enjoyable to talk to you him. You missed that. Head but, coach of baseball. But team. Ross will be back this coming Monday? He should be. Okay. I'll talk to him today probably. All right. Um, and then – Then Eric Garfield we did last night, and he and I will be on again next Thursday. Very good. Getting a lot of good video at – Eric underscore Birdland, uh, a lot of video of the players down there. 
And want to remind everybody that the CIAA That's next week. Is, yep. is in effect. Very excited about it. Gets underway on Monday at the CFG Bank Arena, and we'll be uh, doing some more with the uh, CIAA next week as well. All right. Very good. Don't forget the bat around also tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. with uh, Paul and Ryan. Thanks today to Jeremy Fowler. Thanks also to um, Paul Biancardi. We'll get it up in the greatest hits section of the... Oh, my God. It's so very, good. It was very good. It was Paul. very good. He's outstanding. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. Cole Irvin joins the program on Monday, so uh, you'll want to check that out. The figures he wouldn't come on yep. on a Friday. Oh, and he had some things to say. Thanks, everybody, at PressBox, all of our great sponsors and partners, including Live Casino and Hotel, Mother's North Grill, A.J. Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms, Costa Sin, Superbook Sports, Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, and buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great weekend. Go all the local teams. Duke sucks.